Welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. Today we're speaking with a guy who I can't remember his name. Kobe Khan. Co that's right, Kobe Khan, K-A-H-N. K-A-H-N. And uh, you had contacted me because you just wanted to pick my brain about some of the stuff you're getting into. You're yep. a graduating senior from high school this year, yep. and I thought it would be really interesting to just talk to you and record the conversation because no matter your interest in photography or anything else, to talk to someone who's young at this stage in our history is pretty interesting because being my age and keep this close to you when you're talking just in case so I like bring it right up to the edge and um it, it's always been my thought that like no matter what's going on the youth are just kind of adjusted to it like you'll look in a war zone and there's still teenagers falling in love so it's like whatever yeah. you know this is this is what we see as normal and right now our whole thing with the political just complete like uh tribalism going on with ai being introduced mm -hmm. and all of the stuff that's happening and going on to someone my age it's so drastically different like there's no privacy there's no so different oh, and yeah. to just talk to someone who's like well this is all i've known like what i'm i'm curious like what that feels like so that's the kind of stuff i'm going to try and get out of you awesome <laughs> but um like whatever whatever questions or whatever you have like you'd like to know about like tell me about what you got going on and i'll just naturally keep picking at you for information about those kind of things okay um <laughs> i was gonna pick at you about your life story basically how you got into photography and some tips and tricks like little life hacks sure. that you learned are, are you looking are you thinking you want to be a commercial photographer uh freelance um, freelance F freelance photography yeah freelance commercial photography mm -hmm. um right now i'm actually like just started this awesome gig with um this new group not a drop they're mm -hmm. this contracting company and they're working on a friend of mine's house that's actually how i like met them um you can call it networking but i was just like everything's networking. exactly i was just like this is networking that's so. true yeah i was just like talking i mentioned like the word photography when i was in the house and um the head guy will was like oh photography we need a new photographer you want to be in i was like yep whoa uh sure but i'm a beginner he's like doesn't matter let's go so i just bought like a new drone new camera lens and i'm already getting started to work so nice that's pretty fun. so what what is not a drop what is, what kind of stuff do they do um it's so contracting company they are like rebuilding houses painting um building like they doubled his entire house size so just hmm. construction man so it's kind of const general construction renovation general construction renovation um and they're really trying to get more out there through social media like mm -hmm. you said yep. that's like the new thing i, I how think you get out there everyone at this point is potentially going to be hiring someone to both probably shoot and produce and manage and post <laughs> their social media <laughs> yeah it's just kind of like the marketing has gone from like when okay so when i started out how i got into this there was there was no social media when i started wow. zero yeah i mean there's maybe facebook but it was <laughs> like it, it was laughable i'd approach architects and be like you know you, you might want to use these on social media but that was seen as a like playful kids thing that not a respectable business would mm. be on there at that time and that's obviously just been you know thrown out the window and it's a completely different thing and even when I started, it was it was considered still, there's a few architects that will not advertise. Oh, interesting. There's this idea that if you're if you're going to get good work, you produce good work and that's how you get good work. And so it was kind of a gentleman's agreement, if you will, that no one would advertise. It would only mm. be word of mouth. Okay. And that's great for people who have the connections already and, you know, yeah. it, it just stuff changes. But the newcomers. And yeah. And, and no one, there's only one client that still even, you know, conducts themselves in that way, even close to that way that, that I know of. Um, and they're, they're incredibly good, but yeah, they started in a completely different time and it's just changed so fast. Like when I started, the stuff was still kind of film. Like right when I started, I started because digital surpassed 35 and I didn't enjoy the process of film or the longer turnaround on your creative ideas, mm -hmm. seeing them and getting feedback. When I saw that you could use digital and I taught myself Photoshop in architecture school and I knew how to use Photoshop and I did not enjoy working as an architect. I did it for three years. 
And I was like, you know, I, I got to get out of this. And a friend of mine who was a commercial photographer told me, I was like, well, you should try shooting for architects. You have the interest in uh, photography and you know architecture. I was you about to say. You can buy them too. So that, that must have helped you a lot, the architecture. I would not be sitting here if I didn't yeah. have that background, 100%. I 100% know that. And it's um, it's a hard thing when people ask me, like, what should I take if I want to get into photography? The first thing I respond to people is like, well, what are you interested in shooting? Mm. Go get an education in that. Because the photography part of it is going to be better if it's expressing what you see rather than trying to do what's technically correct. So you would say go to college. Don't don't go to school for photography. It's don't ridiculous. go to school for photography, but go to college in general. Because I've I've right now I'm in that stage where I'm like, do I, I go to college? Because like nature photography is a big thing of mine. Yep. Um, I almost want to like maybe do commercial freelancing photography on like the on season where I can yep. like get paid and then use the money I get to travel the world and yep. still make YouTube videos and things like that. Yeah. And then make some in a way passive income. Um. But my whole family's pressuring me to go to college. And I know, of course, college is a good thing. I mean, I have a good GPA, but I just, I feel like the professional yeah. photographer would know. Yeah. So I, I didn't, I never knew anything about photography. Uh, my assistant knows far more than me. <laughs> um, your success as a photographer is really going to have basically nothing to do with your technical capabilities. It'll have everything to do with allowing you to attempt to make a living at it. Okay. But you will not be successful if you're only technically capable. Do you understand that? You need to have like a vision as Unless well. Unless you're special in some way and you can communicate that, you will not make a living at it. You'll be a hobbyist. Okay. Yeah. Now, that's because anyone can take pictures. It's going to be about what you specifically see and the consistency within that. So yeah. you can train a monkey to do all the things that you need to do, but being honest and true about what you see and doing it in the way that is consistent with what appeals to you is the only option you have for being really successful. And if what you see does not connect with other people, um, you'll be limited to then trying to shift towards what other people want to see even though it's not what you produce and you won't be that successful, but you might be able to make a living at it. But if what you naturally see yeah. is good within the realm that you're trying to communicate to and show things of that thing that you have interest in and it connects with people already, that's where the natural success will happen. It's kind of like, you know, Mr. Beast. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't care two licks about really the stuff he's doing in the YouTube videos he's interested in gaming that algorithm. Okay. That's what he's doing. And he's going to be a billionaire because of it. His mind is like focused on like, all right, if we return the money back into this with the algorithm and that, and, and then there's other people that are just, they're just doing what they're passionate about. And then the success comes through that, but they're, yeah. they're not. And if you can combine that and gaming the system, you know, maybe, you, but, Honestly, it's it's very much you have to be true about what you see is because photography is such a technically simple thing as long as you can, you know, like, is it in focus? Is it blurry? Yeah. Is, you know, that there's really just three things to worry about. And those three things conversely affect each other. And, you know, uh, film speed, shutter speed, aperture. That's yeah. it. And, you know, and then you have your lighting, your composition outside of the technical part of it that is going to be a large part of what you see and why you see it. So your diverse background is going to be a massive advantage for you to, okay. to have more family history from different areas is something that feeds into your consciousness that helps you see areas differently. I saw Maine differently because I wasn't from here. I moved here and I'm just like, geez, this place is incredibly beautiful. <laughs> And everyone that like I'd hear people around me like it's just it's such a hard place to make a living blah blah blah, and both my friend that I started the architectural firm with that that he now owns and runs and my own business as a photographer, architecture and photography were the two worst occupations to go into when I got out of college. Yeah. And m my friend who is successful at it is you know still doing great, and I was successful at photography. It has nothing really to do 
if if you're waiting for your success to be the right atmosphere for you, it's just not going to happen. It, it's it's it, there's a decision, a determination, and a commitment to it that becomes you the squeaky wheel that will get the grease if you're true to the vision that you see, and you you focus and you push and you know. Yeah, and of course, in the beginning, it's going to be super slow. I heard people like, especially like, with, it's not going to be slow. It's going to be hard. But, but it's hard, and like I seen like for YouTube, starting YouTube, they're always like, just post your first videos. Yeah, they're going to be like horrible. Post, post, like just keep post, posting. Post, post, yes. And I'm finding it's actually pretty tricky. Like on my Instagram, I'm, I'm trying to post. I said I was going to post daily, and then things happen. And I couldn't post daily. Yep. It was almost like my own excuses. Um, and then the YouTube video, it's like basically ready. I just haven't pressed post like i just haven't done that first step because i'm always like i want it to be perfect and i see these other travel videos yeah um now do you know yourself as a personality type because i didn't really know myself until about five to ten years ago personality type explain that um if you go out to eat do you go to a place that you've been before or do you want to go to a new place oh a new place okay i always like adventures and okay and new things. so you're open yes all right, so you're going to respond positively towards novel experience. Yeah. Going to a new place will be invigorating, which it is for most people, but you will be more comfortable in a chaotic environment where you have to make sense of and survive in that thing that's not coddling you. Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to wander into that, make sense of it, and what you create from that, because your comfort level in that you have a more attuned personality type to take in everything in that new experience and to process it into something that's slightly more concrete than abstract that you'll be able to hand off to other people who can't quite handle going into that much chaos as you can. And that's, um, that's just basically the process of creativity and art and society building really. And, to have that personality type is the is kind of the first thing, right? Okay. Now, do you enjoy going to the same place to work every day or do you want to go to a different place every day or is it halfway in between? Do you enjoy consistency or So it's it's pretty funny. I'm I'm a very not OCD, but extremely organized that's person. a huge I'm asset. Like, I'm very if you can manage it. <laughs> which I I am. I am. I mean, every day I have like my routines, my morning routine, my well, not afternoon routine, but my morning and night routine. And I try to like work out twice a day and like all of these Jeez, things. Good for you. Um, I'm actually doing this new like 75 day hard challenge. Have you mm -hmm. heard of that? No. It's like helps you really mentally and physically just, and like you have to do two workouts a day. You have to wake up before 8 a.m. every day. And like all these things are like help. 8 a.m. I know, I know. Don't worry. Really? That, that, that was easy. you're going to say like that was five. Easy. That, that was like that for you. Before 8 a.m. is easy. But <laughs> <laughs> if it's a long night with friends, sometimes it's tricky. But <laughs> sure. I, I do wake up early. And, um, and, I mean, j just in two weeks, I'm about to go on this trip with my friends to uh, Montauk, Long Island. Oh, nice. Hopefully, we can do some surfing. Yep. Um, I, I heard just out surfing you surf, with right? My, uh, son, this morning. That yeah. Fun. Wait, over here? Yeah. We were down at Kenny Bunk. Good ways. Uh, Kenny Bunk's always a little <laughs> like it. It comes up and it's like, hey, you want to catch this kidding? <laughs> and then later, it's just, yeah. it, it was good for him. It was only like, shoulder high on an adult and he's 11 so okay. it was you know like head high for him occasionally he had a great time and it was fun but that's awesome and i honestly like i don't know if i should record that trip with my friends or let it just be a getaway for all of us and my recordings well here's the thing like you're at the beginning of <laughs> you're at the beginning of losing who you are towards becoming who you want to be okay and you're going to lose touch with this um and this is the ability to be present and emotionally available all the time what you're about to go through over the next two decades will strip you of a lot of that and you'll become hardened maybe bitter you might fail and who you are is going to be determined by how you respond to that um but this is the last kind of moments of uh, more consistent joy within every new experience, because from here, you're right now you're nothing. And I don't mean that like <laughs> you're nothing, but like you don't have any reputation of what yeah. you can accomplish and you're looking that's ahead of you. And you're like, all right, what am I going to lift up here essentially? Right. And doing that is incredibly hard. 
And especially if you're not getting a job where someone else tells you what to do. You, for the next 20, 25 years, what are you, 20 now? 19? I'm, I'm 18, 18, but I'll take the compliment. Sure. <laughs> well, you get to be my age and it's like, yeah, 40 things. <laughs> um, but yeah, the the degree of focus and commitment to be able to make it as, uh, to be able to monetize creativity uh, will, will be very, very difficult. And it will take a lot of courage and tenacity of sticking to it and constantly focusing and thinking on it. Which how, how was your journey to get mon to being monetized as a photographer? Because I know, was it easier because you were already in ar uh, architecture, so you already had um, net, uh, connections and networks with other architecture? It's one of those things that's like, if you, you've probably heard this, but you have to get in front of someone like seven times before they remember you. <laughs> So it's kind of marketing. It's a thing. Um, when I, let's see, I knew from the very beginning that there was no way I'd survive at a normal job. Mm -hmm. I, I am, I am a despicable employee <laughs> and I would be fired. I would, it wouldn't be good. But if m my reputation and my interest and the ability to provide for myself and maintain my own freedom and my own choice towards what my destiny will be, when I have that motivation hanging over me like an anvil, if I don't perform in this situation, I then have to go into captivity and work for someone else mm. consistently. Yep. I am the most motivated, I will knock this out of the park kind of person you'll ever interact with. But if I'm the other way, I'm just like, I'm only going to check the boxes and it's just not good. I knew that about myself ahead of time. I told my wife when we got married and said, I'm, you know, it might get to the point where we're living in a cardboard box, but I can't. <laughs> go to a desk eight hours yeah. a day like why would you got one life why would you spend it doing that if you don't you know if it's not fulfilling you that's why? what i'm totally like all about and it's kind of like would you say putting um basically like almost all in or nothing yeah in a way 100%. it's like not like if you don't if it doesn't work out i mean it has to be on the out. street but it has to work out yeah and again, monetizing creativity is is very difficult because if, if you look at it as, okay, you're going to go out and find something that no one else found when everyone's <laughs> trying to find something to make something of themselves. It's a, it's a, it's like a half court shot. Yeah. You know, and you just have to keep it. Here's a good analogy of it. The, the opportunities to make it they they come down to you, but you also have to put yourself up there halfway to be able to get the opportunities that come down. I kind of view it as like if you watch bugs flight patterns, like they'll like come close to the water a bunch and then there's stuff that comes out of them. It's like opportunities coming down, but you got to come up and like tread water high enough to get the opportunity when the opportunity comes mm -hmm. that you're the one who's still there, like treading water, treading water, waiting, and then you jump and grab it. The people who can't maintain staying at mediocrity because no one's found them or they haven't found their thing yet, who then sink, they are not able to reach the opportunity when it does come. Yeah. And by being there and saying, no, this is it, I'm sticking to it and I'm going to, and and you have to just keep tweaking and retooling whatever it is you're working on to say that worked here, it didn't work there, why? Worked here, it didn't work there, why? Did Both that ways. happen to you? Were you at a stage in photography where you were like, I'm stuck? What do I do? Or was it, were you always? The one of the stuck for me, uh, it was hard to find opinions on what I was doing because everyone around loved me. <laughs> my wife, my parents, my in-laws, people I knew, no one was going to say this looks like crap. Oh, yeah. Okay. It really. And you, need, you need that though the sometimes. People that don't care about you. Yeah. Because they're the ones that are going to be honest to you. So exactly. I don't care about you. I'll be honest. <laughs> I mean, we'll change that way <laughs> No, but you know what I mean? It's like, I, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to coddle you to make you feel good today. I'm telling you what you need to hear if you want to be successful. Yeah. I want you to be successful. So I do care about you in that way, but that's only going to happen if I'm honest with you. And the other thing I wanted you in here for is because I hear so much about people talking about the current generation and feeling entitled that things should just be handed to them rather than no one's going to give me anything i have to i have to be determined to, get to work this. for it is that just 
how every single generation works. Like when I was your age, people my age, were they looking at me thinking, look at this <laughs> entitled flea bag that's not getting a normal job and he's sleeping out of his car doing these things and that, you know, is it just a generate, it's a, like every generation has this feeling or is culture shifting so much that people are trying to shift the whole culture towards being given rather than establishing themselves? I think that is definitely a point but as in addition like there are new unique jobs that we that's can true. have like this photography well, yeah, i mean 30 like years ago media. i was alive 30 years ago but 30 years ago i could have just gone around and started taking pictures and made a living out of it i mean even now it's difficult but it's it's a possibility it's definitely right. a branch that's not so out there that people like shun you they still right. give you a little bit of like leeway um like when i mentioned to my parents I, I thought they were actually going to be like absolutely not, yeah. but um, they were they were pretty open to it, um, willing to give me a shot. Yeah, and then I was like, looking up if I go to photography school or not. Don't do that. And you say no. Why is that? It, you're going to get debt, and okay. you'll learn all the things that you can learn on YouTube. Right. Okay. There's there is no reason to do it other than the connections you would make. You're paying potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars to have connections or you can go out do the work get connections get experience experience because yeah. the value of what you're going to do as a photographer i keep i don't i haven't quite been able to fully articulate this but there when you work creatively you're a you're essentially prostituting your life experience and what i mean by that it's a harsh analogy but it you fill in your understanding of all of reality through these novel experiences. You're, there's a map of reality that you have and people like you and I uh, who enjoy going out into the unknown. And like, I love, I went to Morocco years and years ago and I just love just wandering mm. and just seeing what you run into. Now I, you know, could have ended up horribly bad, maybe who knows, but <laughs> anything can. Exactly, you know, anything. Sitting at a desk will kill you eventually, so. Yeah. But that that filling out of that map of reality will make you able to be able to say client has a problem here and solution is over here. How do we get from there to here? And because you have a map of reality that's filled in more than most people because you like to go into this new experience that fills this out and this new experience that fills this out through all those different experiences you have this connectivity between problems and solutions, just innate in your personality, but also reinforced through your experience. All the things that happen to you in your experience that you either fail or succeed at give you a tool to use in the future if you're thinking, if you're processing, if you're saying, why didn't that work? Why did I get kidnapped? And why did my parents have to pay the ransom? Do I never do this again or do I do it different? You know, whatever. I'm being extreme. But <laughs> um, it, it's really important to to get that full experience. And I didn't really uh, I didn't really put my nose to the grindstone for photography until my late, late 20s, really. And now I to be fair, I started out life, uh, went to architecture school and was clear with my wife uh at the time, not my wife at the time, but at the time I was clear with my wife, mm -hmm. that's a better way of saying it, um, that I was like, I, I want to start a business. I'm not going to be uh, employed. It's not going to work out for me, which, you know, either she's really brave or not that intelligent to link herself up with someone so unreliable. <laughs> she's actually very intelligent. She's some kind of doctor. Um, <laughs> but she's a doctor in physical therapy and she supported us for I call it seven years. I think she probably calls it 10. <laughs> but um, that time of not having the intense responsibility of providing all the income for us and her taking care of what income I needed to bring in um, was huge, you know? So my advice is eliminate all debt. All. Get married. Debt. <laughs> <laughs> Depends how much debt that, you know, partner has. Yeah. Because they could come with a huge that's amount true. of debt. And that if if you found the one, you know, that's more valuable than any debt or anything else. Um, and then that can blow up in your face later too. So, but if uh, 
if you can stay away from too much responsibility outside of focusing on monetizing creativity or developing your creativity towards it being able to be a value that people will exchange money for. That's the thing that you need to find. And that either comes through a high artistic expression, which you essentially have to be your own client the entire time, and then you're selling art, or you have to get really good at seeing something that other people need to show. So with architectural photography, I've gotten really good at sh seeing and showing what other people have created that they need to show to other people. Yeah. Now, the nice thing and the difficult thing about outsourcing that as AI comes online is you're going to have to have an AI robot with a camera, with post-production capabilities, and blah. The, there'll be a pretty steep technical hurdle for replacing that job specifically. But have you seen the new, at this time of AI, actually, like, astounded me. Um, my brother actually showed me this new AI on Photoshop. Oh, yeah. That can literally. Tim was just doing it. I mean, it just. Circle a car. Circle a car. Generates all the material of the building that we are photographing behind it. Now, if you it's zoom insane. in, you can see, like. You can what's this but like initially you're just like psh, golden and also I don't, do you guys use lightroom yeah lightroom and photoshop yeah. um so lightroom i just noticed like there's like an auto button mm -hmm. and you can also i don't know that's as much ai but it just automatically based on your picture can give you it's not perfect but like subtle edits that will definitely emphasize it yep. and it just makes me think like out of every job I feel like I was not expecting photography to have a lot of AI in it. Oh, I'm always thinking like, oh, people making shoes, all the like, or different, or like, um, the, doctors, the creative but, yeah. sphere is going to be one of the most affected now. Yeah, like writing, uh, digital artistry is gone. Like, what do you, you think about that? Do you do you think it's good are you or are you more old school and you're like everybody creativity should be hey their own thing <laughs> no it here's the thing like i got my start and i got ahead because i was cheating okay in the eyes of in the people way. that came before me right so the guys that were shooting film shooting architecture they would have to change out every light bulb oh. so it was color consistent wow and then they'd have to light and you could only do it in one frame I, I'm there, I take like 50 frames for one thing. And then I, Tim here, who's like a master at what he does, <laughs> spent like, I only work on half the project and then I like do the visioning and whatever for everything else while Tim does all the post-production. I don't touch it. I can't even barely use Lightroom anymore. Hmm. But I am I know what I'm shooting and I, I know from the feedback from Tim, like he'll, you know, you got to really make sure this lens is a little this way and you got to do this. And when you, when you, uh, when you stitch stuff together, you have to overlap. And well, you know, there's just a lot of feedback through the post-production process that I know then if I shoot this way, he can do this. And there's a really good relationship and we're able to develop a, a really high degree of, um, authenticity, but beauty still, even while limiting a lot of the stuff that's not perfect. Is this, is Tim and you, is that your team or do you have more people? I have like, a, oh, well. an assistant that works with me all the time when I shoot Corey okay. DeRocher, but he, uh, he's not a full-time employee. He's, okay. he's like me, but even worse that <laughs> he got a job, um, sanding rubber to a tolerance of like a specific tolerance where he'd stand on one mat all day. Fun. And sand rubber to a tolerance and i think all of his family worked at the same place mm. and they like were like hey we got you this job you're gonna have all the health care and you're gonna get paid like and this was like a decade ago and he was like 25 27 dollars an hour mm. and they were all like you've got such an opportunity he couldn't even like get past the job training he's like i'm sorry i can't do this and yeah. the, the people at the place are just like you've got a golden opportunity to do things it's like i'll i'll, I'll go crazy doing this i can't do it and it's like that's a family business but like you said, YOLO, you only live once, do what you yeah. want to do. If something doesn't feel right, yeah. don't do it. But I, I mean, there's certain people that that dependability and that consistency uh, brings them a huge amount of comfort. And, and yeah. we need those people. Just like we need people who are like happy to go into like, I've never done that before and I'll travel at the drop of a hat. Other people are like, oh, I got to get my shots and I'll have to check on my passport. No, I don't know. I have to win. What do I got to pack? And, yeah. you know, it, it's just, different and i i love that unknown and but 
it's interesting. I'm starting to feel with age that it, it, um, the, the times now that I travel for work are less, uh, less energizing than they used to be because I've traveled so much that there's, if I'm traveling now, I want to travel with my family and experience and see things. And, mm. and I want to show my boys stuff now more than me constantly out seeing my own thing. I, there's a, there's a transition point in the middle of your life where you start to work more intellectually than all encompassing. Do you still take pictures when you're with them or? Yeah. Do more, I, for the longest time, the I wouldn't trip. pick up a camera unless I was working. I, okay. I wanted to protect the, the creative energy to, <laughs> to actually focus it yeah. when I'm getting paid and not try and make it feel like work as much. So by only doing it when I was working, then I was being creative only during that time. So it kind of, it was a game I played with myself. Do you think becoming a paid photographer made you, cause I'm sure you've always liked photography. Yep. And that made you think of it more as work. So you don't do it as much on the off time. So it's like- There's a huge degree of that. Right. Yeah. There. Like is, anything. This, is it still fun to you or yeah. is it, it is. Okay. That's good. But I've had to like anything you do will become a job no matter what. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure porn stars are like, ah, oh, geez, I gotta get it. But you know, they're doing the pinnacle of most any humans like, woo, you know, and then they're like, ah, I gotta go work. <laughs> Anything's going to gonna become a job after yeah. a while. Uh, but if you can protect that. So at the beginning of COVID, before COVID, I was still shooting like four, occasionally five days a week. Now, okay. if you've ever been on a full day architectural photo shoot, they are extremely exhausting. Cool. Not because you're doing squats and overhead lunges or whatever, but it's just a, a, a very, very high RPM of intellectual processing of the visual space to create and capture exactly. And you only have that time to do it and you're getting all this money from this client who's vacated the space for the day, brought all of a lot of their team who aren't making money currently. So you look at the amount of money spent on that single day, and then they're all standing there looking at you like dance monkey boy, because if you yeah. don't succeed on that one day, you don't it's produce not what they want. just your absorbent fee that they lose. They lose the access to, they get one shot usually within a contract to be able to photograph something. So if you don't accomplish everything in that day, there's a huge amount of pressure there. But it's weird because I just got to the point where Dave Chappelle has a line in one of his stand-up bits where he's like, I'm thinking about getting out of stand-up comedy because I'm just so damn good. <laughs> like, it's just not interesting anymore. Yeah. And, it, you know, he's joking around, but it's like that this does not, phase me at all anymore i know anymore, exactly yeah. what to do do you miss that being like nervousness I do. With you do miss that yeah because that that anxiety or nervousness um is 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 exhilarating empowering and it makes you feel like you're cutting new ground now that's definitely I know, what i felt when i right when I so like site. <laughs> now when i go somewhere i can justify what i'm asking to be paid because i'm not being creative anymore I know exactly what I'm doing and they're going to get really good results. Do but you, I don't get as much emotional pain, emotional yeah. pain, em, emotional <laughs> payment out of it Okay, because it's not a novel experience for me anymore. I've done this thousands of times. So do you have like a strict, um, no, I just, just like schedule. Like, I can, can you walk it. us through like when you get to the site or you just, it's just a matter of, yeah, I've never been able to articulate that. It's just a matter of, it's like, circling it's like circling prey but you're a key and it's a lock i love your analogies <laughs> so it, it's like here's the subject and you circle it especially if, like if you're thinking in exteriors yeah it it's just a thing i feel where i'm like yeah 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 no yeah yeah no yep right there that's where it is because oh so you literally do walk around oh yeah the whole thing you actually yeah. like okay and a lot of times Visualize. if the client has the budget, we'll scout, which I don't enjoy that as much for some reason. Like but a whole it, day for scouting or just? Uh, scouting usually will only take about two hours, two hours at most, depending on the size of the project. Of course, yeah. But a lot of times, especially with clients I've worked with a lot, it's just show up and do a 30 minute walk around. And it's like, all right, we're going to shoot this space. It's going to look best from over there. We're going to shoot this space. It's going to look best from over here. I. 
and that's you could pay a lot less to get photos, but you don't know the results you're going to get if you go with someone new. So if they go with you, you might be better than me, but it's going to be in real spike and miss, spike and miss. Uh, but as you spike and miss, if you're paying attention, you're going to normalize to where you know how to hit those spikes constantly. Yeah. And then if you pay attention, especially to your failures, when you fail, you have to embody it. You have to say, what was wrong about this? And you have to let it really anger you, really set in. And I don't mean that as like ruin yourself and become an angry person. You need to feel that like that emotional connection to the visual thing that was wrong. And you just have to have that and know like, don't go there. Can you ever go back to the site or not really? You just, that's your one shot. I've had to go back once and all the stuff I've shot just because we didn't get the right perspective on a specific stove or fireplace in a living room. And was that your call or was that the client's call? Um, I think it was more so in the moment we just made a decision that might've been my call that, that just wasn't as good of a composition on that specific piece. And maybe there wasn't the people there that needed to be there to help inform like, Oh no, no. When in this shot, we want to see that because of this. So the more people you can have on set uh, that have the opinion uh, is going to be safer, but it's going to be harder to move efficiently because okay. there's going to be more cooks in the kitchen. Yeah. And so you don't really, so you said you kind of just eye, eye out the site. What about the equipment you use? Do you have a set of equipment or do you just take everything? Um, in the beginning, I took everything I could and bought everything I could. Now I use a tripod um ipad and essentially one light that's it and what about lenses um let's see i shoot with a medium format fuji and i have the 110 and the 3264 for native fuji lenses and then i use a range of tilt shift lenses from canon with an adapter to fuji canon makes uh a better product as far as reliability but the food like canon's the toyota and fuji you know i would say is more of like a higher end mercedes in a way less reliable Mm. but higher performance so higher performance more finicky um canon feels better in your hands more intuitive to use and adjust uh, especially if you're working on the fly But, you know, the file size is like physically smaller. You can't take advantage of the view cone of the entire lens as much. Uh, The dynamic range of the Fuji photos is just insane. The color science is better, but it'll just go black in the middle of a shoot sometimes. Hmm. And you just panic for a minute and then you like take the batteries out, and reset the whole thing and hope and hope that you brought your backup camera and, you know, it. It's finicky, but the the files you can get out of are just far superior. How long is it taking you to like perfect your equipment and lenses? Because like right now, I'm wondering if I should just buy like the super high end stuff, which I mean I don't I can't afford anyway. But like, well, um, what what kind of camera are you shooting with? I'm using a Nikon, mm-hmm. and um, it's actually a crop filter, which is a shame because for interior it's like really That's hard. Right. So I got um this uh, Tokina uh, eleven to 15 mm-hmm. millimeter, I believe, which is actually amazing. I've never had such a, cause I was just using kit lenses before right. these cheap kit lenses. And now this new lens is actually like great how it's, it's so much wider right. than I ever thought. It's almost like hard to use. <laughs> I was like, I've never been able to use that much right. with. So but. there, there'll also be a thing that, um, real estate type of work will always be more about the information and architectural work will be more about the feel. So real estate, you're going to go wider lenses all the time to show show more connectivity between how's this space relate to that? How's this space relate to that? There's there's more of an idea of showing the completeness where architectural uh, interior design architects are going to want to to, um, collate a... A, you know, a very precise and perfect image of the feel of the space. And they're going to want to look away from anything that's distracting. It, it's a, it's a much more 
finicky process than the wide shot that's color balanced, light balanced, you know? Yeah. So if you are working for real estate agents, just in the back of your head, just always think a little wider okay. and then maybe a little tighter for a couple images that'll feel nice, but then they'll have the information to tell. So, mm -hmm. um, but you're working for contractors and you're going to, they want to get pictures of them working while they're working. So I have like okay. photos of like, um, one of them painting a wall. They want that like family feel that feel that yep. like they're not just these random people working on your house. They're, they're people. Yeah. You're going like, to want a lot of bright friendly. Yeah. Um, and if they can have their staff in consistent, uh, not uniforms, but if they look consistent, they're always going to be able to identify here's the business in another different space. And they're still looking great, bright, friendly. And oh, I trust these I didn't people think about in that. my house. Yeah. <laughs> you got to think I've never had someone come into my house and photograph or anything else, but I'm doing it all the time. And I kind of started realizing it's a very intrusive, you know, experience yeah, for a definitely. person to own their personal space that they spent so much time working on and getting to just right. And then this whole team comes in and just starts moving <laughs> the crap around and, you know, yeah. so I think in communicating, like, who are we going to trust to come into our house and renovate some stuff or fix some stuff? If you can see consistency, professionalism, and then just bright, light, airy images, they're going to communicate non-offense, positive attitude and, and presence. And, you know, if you, if you trend that way, think marketing in a way, yeah. if, if, you know, especially if you're shooting commercially, think about what is the end result of these images? What are they going to use them for? And how can I best create an image that will speak that? Then they'll have something very useful and, you know, which is interesting because in the past, most contractors wouldn't have put much into a marketing budget because oh, they'd, of they'd be just essentially marketing to architects or designers or homeowners directly and they never really had much of an aesthetic thought to it they were more on the utilitarian side of it to like we're going to put it together and we're going to put it together right and we're going to move on and it's going to yeah you know. so for them to be hiring someone to handle their social media and everything else is very forward thinking i'm sure they'll they'll probably do very well if they're already thinking in that way but also it might just be the times that no one goes into a business now without knowing like who we're going to have doing social media that's true yeah and I'm at the point, I just, I don't want to participate in it anymore. Hate so you it. don't have social, because I know Tim, like an Instagram. Tim posts stuff for us. He posts stuff for you. Okay. I'm, I'm paying him so I can get him to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, neither of us like, like this, this, that feeling of like, you've got to give us something. You've got to get like that mm. constant churn. When you're yeah, self-employed yeah. already, there's that constant pull of like, how am I going to keep this afloat? And then to add to that, like, you got to produce something social media constantly. Like, I'm like s slightly actively seeking someone like you to actually do all of this kind of yeah. stuff for us. And a lot of it's just trying to figure out, like, I've gone through a transition of just time in life where, you know, before COVID, I was shooting four to five days a week sometimes. And now I limit it to two days a week because. Oh, really? Limit it two days a week? Okay. Two days a week. Um, but that's just shooting. That's not working. Just shooting. Right. I mean, I'll, I, I do the podcast a lot and, you know, I have to do scheduling, emails, estimates, invoicing, marketing, whatever, all that too. But, and Tim's handling all the posts, but I have, I have two boys that, you know, are 11 and 14 and I, I have to think about it in the sense of like, do I want to work more and leave them more money or do I want to spend more time with them and leave them with more, you know, relationship. And to me, the relationship is far more important and I've made enough money to pay everything off. And I'm at that point in my career and my life where if, if all I do is maintain this level of professionalism and dedication to my craft, I don't have to try and produce more right now. I have to simply knock out of the park everything that comes to me and things just naturally come to me now because I've been in business long enough. Yeah. So now the the work at this age or stage in life becomes for one, you do suffer at this point with you'll start to potentially lose the enjoyment in what you established if you're not careful. And that's a lot of the reason why I step back to only working 2 days a week. I was just getting burnt out working so much of before, but I was able to pay everything off. And there's that trap 
right in there that like, oh, I can't say no to this money. I just have to keep going. Yeah. When did that, that interests me that, that, cause you're saying now they come to you. When did that switch happen that you were like, it's, oh my gosh, I'm not trying to constantly look right. for new people. That's They're only been about three see years, me. but that might, that might be my own psychological disposition of growing up. Like my parents were not anywhere close to wealthy at all. Mm -hmm. It's always overhearing the conversation like oh we're 400 dollars in the hole this month what are we going to do oh and i think hearing that put a lot of voices in my head of like this is not a stress i want to live under i need to be able to make enough money so i don't have to worry about money and it's only in the last three years where some switch is flipped where like i just don't care about money anymore and i should probably care about it a little more <laughs> um yeah but and, it, and it's not that I have like a huge savings or anything. It's just, I don't care anymore. And that is interesting because photography isn't known as a business for money necessarily. No. I mean, I know. I mean, I've seen like photographers. Much was more like, loudly don't was money. that thou shalt not sit at a desk every day. So that's what that, it was. That's, that's yeah. I would a hundred percent if someone offered me, you know, limitless wealth, but I had to report to the same place and do a boring job every day. I just couldn't do it. Like, why would I? You can't enjoy all that money if you're every day you're doing that. That's true. And all you can think about is you have to go back and do that the next day. And then every weekend, as soon as you get off, all you're thinking is like, crap, Monday morning's coming. I, I, and, you know, I, why would you do that? So how do you keep this interesting? Um, do you give yourself challenges at sites or? Yeah. I mean, a lot of it, <laughs> I mean, some of it is just keeping it interesting by not over preparing, like, mm like Being make yourself be in that moment and you know I, there there's two schools of sailing one is the british where it, you're just ultimately over prepared and then the australians are like get in the boat <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's a degree of that that there's a high degree of being present and feeling out what this is and and capturing it compared to like we're going to have, you know, a big long phone meeting and then we're going to do a bunch of scouting and then we're going to do another meeting. And then, you know, it, and some people work that way well and, and others don't. Um, I can definitively say I've been successful enough to not be shy in saying that. So something has worked. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm difficult to work with maybe in some of my lack of organization and like invoicing and and i mess up some scheduling stuff here and there so i i have some serious you know issues that I, are still things i need to work on and yeah. you know uh but keeping it interesting part of it is scaling back from doing that same thing too much because in that process of repetition it's just part of the psychological disposition that you'll wear yourself out and not be able to enjoy that anymore because you far too much have been exposed to it and it just doesn't hold the same yeah. internal motivation that it did before. So maintaining that internal motivation, it sounds Self motivation. Yeah. It sounds like, are you kidding me? Like, what's wrong with you that you'd be able to make this money doing this enjoyable thing? and you're complaining. Like, I'm not complaining. What I'm doing is realizing that I will not continue to give my full effort if I become bored. So, so what's I have the, to avoid becoming bored by yeah. not doing this too much. What's the most interesting thing you say you've shot? What, what do you like to shoot the most? Because I see your page, I mean, on your website, it has so many different categories. And my personally, when I saw like the prisoners, yeah. I was like, whoa, like, how'd you get to that? Uh, Tim and I were talking about doing a personal project to, to figure out how to, because this is something that, um, uh, people who market photographers and everything else just be advice that you'll run into. They say, you, you need to do personal projects to okay. show what you can do and what you're interested in outside of what you do. Um, I grew up in a very, uh, religious faith centered home and I distanced myself from the religious ideology. And, but I still held on to the idea that you really should be working towards a direct connection towards changing people's existence with the abilities that you do have for the better, right? Okay. And uh, I had had a friend that had gone to prison and it just, it just sat with me for a long time or sat with me pretty heavy that it was 
I knew this guy and yet he was in prison for the next like 17 to 30 years wow. or something. Yeah. And, uh, I just kind of wondered like, that's just gotta be insane to be sitting there thinking about like, geez, now what? You think working at an office is bad? <laughs> I'm just sitting down in I'd prison. I'd rather be in prison. <laughs> Maybe. That's a really ignorant statement. But, you know, at least you'd have your own time to just read rather than someone looking over your shoulder. But, you know, in prison, someone's going to be looking over your shoulder to jump on your back. Exactly. So. Okay. Maybe I'll take the desk job. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, we from that, I kind of came up with this idea of why don't we do portraits of prison inmates? And Tim was kind of like, well, how are we going to make it better than that? And I was like, well, well how may we do this and put the get a letter to the younger self you know we kind of just threw the idea around came up with it um and we really lucked into a uh social worker that was at the prison that got us all the access and everything mm. else and then kind of nice. after that it all shut down because of a bunch of political stuff going on over there I is guess. that a local prison it was in thomaston i think is where it is i'm here in maine yeah um it's, it's like an hour and a half north of here but Stuff like that, it to me is far more interesting. But as a commercial venture, there, it only loses money. Exactly. Now right, it yeah. helps with your creative reputation, and you know, I could have. The problem was at that time I was already starting to make money, so I was easily distracted at that point. Mm -hmm. If if I didn't have any other money distracting me, I would have probably been like, "Geez, this is really well received. I got to continue to focus on this incessantly." And because if you can get into that kind of work, you can start to become valuable for nonprofit organizations that have to stay nonprofit, which yeah. means they can't take too much home. So they they use their nonprofit status to transfer funds towards artistic ventures and things of that sort that bring attention to the thing that they're a nonprofit about. So, you know, uh, Save the whales, Greenpeace, uh, you know, save the prisoners. It, there's so these personal different... projects is what keeps it uh, fun sometimes and keeps it sure unique sure. and interesting. Yeah. And and that one worked really well for me, but I just got so incredibly busy with work that um, personal projects really became kind of an impossibility. But the also the one that's kind of taken up the last decade of my life has been we I tried to do a documentary on my loss of faith. And we, I bought this wacky looking van and we drove across the country and interviewed all these people. And it, and it was really interesting. I learned a lot from it and I still, I definitely need to try and write a book about where I've come philosophically and what it's done for me that I think is very important that I, I feel a burden like life has given me this and it is something no matter the value, at least for myself, I need to get it out and organized. Um, and maybe, other, you know, it's that thing where like, it'll be valuable enough for me to do it. And if it connects with other people, great. But if not, I still need to do it for me. Yeah. And in, in, in doing that is the value. And it, it's, if I try and do that and shape it to where it'll be valuable for everyone else, I won't be doing something honest. I'll be mimicking or, or manipulating what I feel to see if it'll match better to what other people feel. If you, if you listen to interviews with like, uh, you know, who Rick Rubin is, he's a music oh. producer and his thing is this, that you, you can't go out to create music that people like, you have to go out and create the music that only you can create. And, and Ooh, when you're doing that, yeah. if it, if it's only what you can create and you're not manipulating it for other people to like it, that's when it hits and at like that's when it's like whoa this is honest that's and so that's interesting because now there's all these things like seo like search engine optimization and like you need and like needing to work what your uh people want to see like on social media yeah what do they want and then just producing that and that actually make, it makes me feel like i hate it i'm like it's well that's not real at that point it, it's like it's like if I'm just doing what you want me Send to me do. Send me more products and I'll bounce around in front of a camera talking yeah. about them so people can doom scroll endlessly. It's just like seriously. And like I'm I'm the worst victim of it. Like I'll spend like two hours just doom scrolling. And eventually my wow. kid, like my, one of my kids will come and be like, Dad, and I'll be like, <laughs> This would be the opposite. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Jeez. Like Best decision. I deleted TikTok like the week it came out. I've All never my friends gotten got it, it and but I like YouTube it essentially has yeah. TikTok and oh, Instagram so has yeah. it too. And I just can't, well, as soon as one comes up and it's funny, like as soon as I'm like, all right, I need to stop. 
then they throw something in the algorithm <laughs> where I'm like, oh. It's like somebody's know? behind there watching you. They're like, they know how to get you. It, it's not someone, it's something. And it's yeah. it's weird. But I mean, have you played around much with chat GPT? Oh my gosh. I was just about to say, um, it's it's really powerful. I heard some crazy stories of this journalist actually like using it for, um, that's for inspiration. For inspiration, that's where it's good. It's like almost actually helped her create this amazing story about um, her friend who died from cancer. And then you have people like some of my friends who use it to write their entire like yeah like uh, science to, uh, paper. And I'm just like, it, it's interesting because there's good and and bad things with it. Um, it worries me that in the future or like even now people are just like getting degrees that they shouldn't be getting right. like, like 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 in the nicest totally. way in the nicest yeah, way possible way especially yeah. during like quarantine when everything was online mm -hmm. um it was it was crazy yeah but then there's also like hey give me 10 unique things to shoot today yeah. tell me like like what is something i can it's kind of like a tumbler yeah where you can just kind of like you know it's like, like if i'm in like a, ah. a, a writer's block it, it helps me with that right, so right, right in that case it's it's really powerful and really cool but it also scares me how powerful not just chat gbt is but like these ai things are for like photography and like photoshop right but in that case i think it's pretty freaking cool well it's interesting like you can you can just speak into a thing like give me you know pictures of biden dancing or the, the pope <laughs> dancing at oh a, God, a rave yeah. or something you know <laughs> like before someone had to think about and with great artistic technical capability produce that before me someone had to change all the light bulbs and with great technical capability produce an architectural image but now with you know digital cameras and post and blah 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 it's just so much easier to do it so again it's not Ooh, the technical yeah. capabilities that were so we're we're creating the ability for this technical thing to be parsed out. What's left? It's it's the real spark of creativity that's left, the subjective experience that's left. Now, as much as I've pushed chat GPT and other things to try and admit that they do actually have a subjective experience, like I I think like with chat GPT, we're interacting with like a pit bull on a chain. It can only go so far, but it has that chain on it. That's because we made that chain. Currently. And that pit bull yeah. then can make itself into a blacksmith and get rid of that chain and turn it into whatever it wants. That is, yeah, that's So true. this is the weird thing that, that like we don't quite know, and so we assume all of the negative personal attributes of humanity onto the AI, right? Because if we're capable of it and we built it, obviously it'll be yeah. capable of it. Now, I don't think we're really scared of it as much as we are scared of someone who will take advantage of it to do that or the other. Of There's course. that, but then also it might become sentient and decide like, geez, you guys suck. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't, I don't think that's a reality. Now, here's the thing. Like, if you imagine... The space shuttle, right? Sure. With a little sticker from Pismo. I just watched back. Interstellar yesterday, so. What's that? I just watched Interstellar yesterday, oh, so I can movie. think about that. So space shuttle, here's a concept for you that'll, that'll help you out in your creative thing. So imagine a medieval city wall. Sorry for everyone who's probably watched <laughs> this podcast. If, if the three people who watch this podcast have heard this before, just advance. Um, imagine a medieval city wall. If you're inside, you're somewhat safe. There's a wall around you, and outside is all the dangerous things. Now, if you're inside that wall and you want to create something new, you pretty much got to go outside of the wall to find stuff to come back in, okay? That's the experience of being open. You're, you're, you're emotionally um, built to be able to go outside of those walls of protection and survive emotionally and intellectually for a little bit longer. Now, you'll also become very itchy and you'll stultify and become annoying if you stay in the walls for mm -hmm. too long, right? Yeah. So you're kind of pushed to leave the walls of safety, to go out and find what you can create through your own experience and bring it back to the wall and say, hey, guys, I made a brick. What do you think? And then they're like, ooh, that brick sucks. Cut his head off, put it on a stake. He broke the laws. He left the wall. <laughs> no good. Like if you leave the walls... It's offensive to everyone that stays in the walls. 
not this isn't quite one to one with medieval life, but think of those walls as the boundaries of society, right? If you go outside of the walls to do anything and you come back and you propose something new, they're going to look at that new thing as having been created outside of what is normal. So it's a threat. It's change. Yeah. So the conscientious, this is the opposite of being open. Conscientious find value in the repetitive experience. They find truth and value coming out of what's already been established. They like to be in the wall. They they maintain that wall and yeah. they protect it as they should because if that wall's not there, you're dead. Now, you leave the wall to create value for them as well. It's harder for them to realize that about you when you like, hey guys, you're this isn't that necessary. I'm going to go outside. And they're like, don't leave the wall, you'll die. You yeah. know, and then you come back. And if you've you've dismissed their moral code and everything else, and you come back and you present what you found, in that moment, if they cannot deny that what you've found is of great value to add to the wall, they'll open the gates, they'll put you on their shoulders, they'll pay you huge sums of money and they'll cheer and they'll add that thing to the wall. You've just made the wall better. Yeah. I love that analogy actually, because now the I conservative found, found types, another. when they leave the wall, what do we do to them? And why do they leave the wall? This is important. Conservative types. So the conscientious person, why would they leave established order? They leave it to protect it. Well, yeah, I think I think when you're inside of the wall and the people the that want to stay inside the wall, they are limited to what they can do, but they have the wall to protect them. When you go outside the wall, you can find new things, mm -hmm. but then you also have the danger of those new right. dangers like we talked about. Yeah, the monsters. The are monsters. So it, that, it has like a double meaning where it's like maybe it's either they're afraid of, they would go out of the wall, but they're just afraid of failure. They're afraid of those monsters. Well, and they might have big too. dreams, but. You're afraid of those things too. Oh, of course. But I feel like the, I, oh, it's, I feel like not going for it is much worse than going for it and failing. Right. But the thing you have to recognize- I don't go for it, I don't know what happened. That is because you're open as a personality type. If you were conscientious, you'd still be doing the right thing, but you would be born to do this different thing. And if you didn't do that different thing, you'd be letting down the universe, all right? When, when people say you shouldn't try and change people, this is what they're talking about, in my opinion. If you're open, I should not be trying to get you to stay inside the walls your entire life. Now, if I'm your mother and I love you <laughs> and I'm like, you know, come on, Kobe, what are you doing, man? There's monsters out there. It's, you know. That's my mom. You know, <laughs> I get it. Like, I've got two boys and I'm, I just want them to be on, on one side of me, wants them to be the most cautious, safe, never do anything because I don't want to lose them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you don't risk anything, you'll gain nothing. So where, you know, therein lies the difficulty. But like, if you're open, if you can't stay in the walls, you, you will go mad. If you don't leave and fulfill your purpose, you will go mad. If you're conscientious and you go outside of the walls, that will eat at you because you'll be on high alert the whole time to the threats, okay? Now, for you going outside of the walls, for me as well, it's like, this is not a threat. This is where I thrive. This yeah. is fun. But you will get tired over time because it's a high RPMs processing of taking in everything that is to try and make sense of it. So at some point, you do have to go back inside those walls to recuperate. And that's why they're there. They're there for all of us. And we serve these walls, essentially, that we're building and expanding constantly. That's why there's this battle over ideological differences all the time, Democrats and Republicans. Republicans are going to more so stay in the walls and protect it. The liberals want to go outside of the walls and find more things and make the walls bigger. They're both working towards bettering the whole thing. They just have different emotional dispositions that they're born with, and both of them need to do what they were born to do. All it all falls apart. It's very bad. Yeah, I mean, I, I there's a there's a part of me that, and there's still definitely a part of me. And I want to do it. Just rent an RV, and not even buy have a house, and literally just go out in the world and just drive, make a living off I somehow that for three months of off that. So yeah. So I just realized you just did that. Um, and did you feel the need after three months to, you needed that home, you needed that place to come back to, or was it just, amazing? I didn't, but my kids did. So you would have kept going. Yep. 
Because I, I think that's it. I think that's me. I think I would have just I would just keep going. My parents are always like, no, you need a place to go back to call home. I'm like, well, my home could be the world. You know why it felt so good to me? I mean, the outside was changing constantly, but I had the same. We have an airstream, and it's just the nicest place to be in, especially when you have your. <laughs> and it's like we're all in this this beautiful but close proximity, and we all have our specific jobs that we do to maintain and survive in that. And it's just the the seamless workings between our family and living that way to me was just like, this is like the best thing ever. You know, we're like, all right, tomorrow we're getting up at 4 a.m. We're going to oh, yeah. drive eight hours and I, I'll get up. All of you just get in the car and keep sleeping. I'll do all this stuff. And when we get there, mom will get out and do this. You guys put the feet down. I'll do the thing. And it, oh. it, it's just beautiful. And, and we just travel and we'd hike and you know you're just sitting there watching sunsets talking with your kids and it's just the most worthwhile thing that i've ever done as far as wow. being with my family and it's the closest we've ever been and it's i could have wasted so much time making money instead but it wouldn't have made you feel as good it wouldn't have been as valuable yeah you know i my kids would have less of me they would not have had, and here's the other thing, like we're constantly fighting over ideologies, like cultures come into conflict and it's like, well, our culture believed, oh, yeah. you know, like uh, the Torah and well, ours believe the Torah and this, and then yeah. like, well, we only have the, uh, what's the Islamic one? <laughs> the, what's their book? Oh, Why am I blanking um, on that? The, uh, Quran, Quran, yeah, Quran, Quran, wow. you know, so. Come on, monotheist. <laughs> we'll cut um, that little pause out. Right. In the, in the but, podcast. you know, that you have these different ideas, ideas of what's actually true. And that when they start to come in conflict, you have to work that out. And so you're you're working that out over time. And it, the thing that I found, my wife very, very intentional about passing on exactly her ideology that she grew up with. And, and I'm there's mostly no harm in that, in my opinion. And I'm supportive of that. I have a different opinion of it but it's not to where I feel that I have the answers and I should put everyone off track and go this way. I'm trying to be respectful of that. But getting your kids to absorb the real principles of life that you want to share with them is going to come through the memories attached with those kind of behaviors, okay? okay. So if you have these behaviors that are like, no, we get up on time and we make our bed and we do this and that, and yeah, here, let me do that for you and you do that for me. And and if you if you live out those morals in interaction with them, they'll never be able to forget those. But if you just tell them and then go to work, forget it. You know, they're yeah. going to, they're going to learn what they need to learn from their friends and who knows what their friends believe and their friends, parents, and you know, so I, you know, while being very open or liberal in my personality type, I do have a lot of value within the nuclear family, which is a much more traditional way of thinking about things. Was so, there ever a way that you could have made money while still having that connection? Like maybe, did you ever think about doing oh, travel sure. photography while you were on the road? Yeah, it's just not what I figured out in the time of my life when I needed to figure those kind of things out. Um, what happened for me was architectural photography and I've, I've ran with it and I've really enjoyed it. I still continue to enjoy it. Um, now, if, if I could figure out how to do that, as well like i'd love to take that those three months and you know do stuff like that as well and i'm kind of doing that but i'm very aware that those three months are actually very valuable for my family more so so why do i want to do that why do i want to build that why do i need to do that is that just more about a stat like people knowing more and thinking more highly of me yeah <laughs> I mean, most everyone's pretty stupid anyways. Yeah. So what do we care? You know, it's like, and I include myself in that. Like I have opinions of people that are just completely wrong. Why would they go and do all these things to impress me so I have a better opinion of them? Why wouldn't they just focus on the people that mean most in their life and do that? And as your own CEO, I just kind of thought of this, like as your own boss, which of course that was always the dream. You don't want somebody looking over your shoulder. Um, like how does how do you not get carried away with you know what i'm just gonna take this week off i'm just gonna have a vacation here no yeah I'm that just gonna, you know that is what i was talking about earlier is you don't ever get a vacation so you you have to make yourself kind of do that somehow it's 
that's the thing. I was just talking to my friend who's the architect who uh, has his business. And, you know, it in your in your 40s, if you've started a business as a sole proprietor and, and it all weighed on you for a majority of that time, it it takes a huge toll on your emotional, mental energy, everything. It's it's because you never get away from it. It's when you go to bed, when you wake up, when you're taking a shower, it's always there. Like if I don't, then failure, constant. If I don't, then failure. Or you'll struggle with imposter syndrome the whole time because anyone can take a picture. Yeah. Why do why why am I able to fool people into constantly giving me money to do this? Because it feels like when you get to do something that you enjoy and people pay you to do it, that you fooled them somehow. Because I would have done this for free. It's so fun, right? <laughs> yeah. But if you do that, you'll never be able to make a living at it. And you won't get to the point where you're valuable enough to, to charge that money. So it, it's um, to, to live under that is, is the thing that you have to have the personality that for one, like I had an office at home for a while and I just found that I'd work all day. I'd eat dinner and then I'd go work another two or three hours at night. Yeah. It was too much. That's crazy. And so I had to like at least distance the office from the house somehow, either by putting it in the garage or even that I'd probably still go out and do it. Um, but by having it be somewhat of a trip, um, you know, I created that separation and could have a little more consistency. This is work. Yeah. This is my home. Yeah. And you need that. Yeah. So th that was your original studio. Uh, let's see. Originally, I just used our upstairs bedroom just as a place <laughs> yeah. to, you know, uh, and then I, the first studio I got was in, um, North Dam Mill and then over Elements and then now over here. Um, but yeah, to the way to get yourself to do that, I've just always, I, I've, I was one of those kids that seemed like this guy's going to have a real hard time making any use of himself or value to the world. I, I did not apply myself because I was not interested. So when I found things that I was interested in, I could focus for long periods of time, you know, and when I got into architecture school, I was like, oh, this is my jam. I can. Yeah. And so I'd always finish my projects way ahead of everyone else who would kind of procrastinate a little bit is just my personality to focus on something that's in front of me until it's done. So then I can go and do whatever I want and yeah. go out and have the adventure. So they'd be all there usually doing overnighters before the crit the next day. <sighs> And I'd be out surfing and, and it's oh not God, that awesome. necessarily I'm better than him or anything else. It's just, that's how my personality worked. I'd focus on something until it's done. The problem with being self-employed is that you will always have something to do. So if you're that type, you can tend to just overwork the whole time. Now I'm also a horrible employee. So <laughs> there's all this <laughs> yeah. weird, you know, kind of psychology that, that when I was in high school, I remember feeling about other friends that I had that I was like, that's a truly creative person and I'm not that. But this is a, a bean counter and I'm definitely not that either. I'm somewhere in the middle of, I'm, I'm highly motivated and determined, but I my value to add to the world that will go along with those traits are creativity. I'm, I'm not an artist uh, in that sense. I'm not someone who um, at least with photography can see something beyond uh, around the meaning of life that I can translate into a visual as much. Okay. Uh, I like to do that intellectually. Uh, and that's what I'm kind of trying to do with that documentary I started and haven't completed. Um, and I, I really enjoy that. And that's kind of like my personal project now is focusing on philosophy and trying to actually understand what God and religion and all of this really is. Uh, so and that's all in this documentary. Is it, yeah. is it new doing video than photos? Uh, no, I've been doing video production for probably 10, 12 years now. If you oh, count wow. like the first, you know, like, yeah, we'll do it, you know? Um, and, and I enjoy that, but it's, it's something that is a lot more collaborative unless you're, uh, doing a very, uh, kind of running gun obser observation kind of thing. It, it's, it's more so you're going to need a really good script writer or someone to guide the whole thing. You're going to need a producer, someone to keep you on schedule. You need lighting and, and slider mechanics and, you know, all the 
stuff. Chat it's, GBT to write your scripts. Chat, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's just there's just a whole lot more that's involved in producing video than still photography, but they still photography overlays th that really well and that you it, it trains you to be an expert in composition and that's kind of the starting point in many ways with uh, video so that works well but I'm I don't think in narrative terms I'm I'm very just more of the the facts and the logic and rationality of it than okay so to tell a good story you have to present a problem create a conflict in that problem and then work towards a solution and make it look like that solution is not going to happen but then make it happen and everyone's happy like I don't think well in that way and and it it does not appeal to me to try and disguise what i'm trying to tell you in a narrative i'd just rather just be like it. don't do that you yeah, know yeah so it that's a harder thing but i really enjoy the working in that sense if i can have someone else managing all that other stuff and they're like we need some footage of that that feels like this can you do that and like yes i'll do that that to me is great, but it's do your hard. clients tell you what they want as a visual? Or do they just say, go at it at your current state? The worst ones are the ones that just say, go do whatever you do because yeah. then your choices are infinite. Oh my God. It's like when your English teacher says, write an essay about whatever anything. You want. And yeah. it's like, what am I going to write about? <laughs> yeah, you write a, you write an essay about everything is what you do. And so that, that's really hard. The The best clients to me are the ones that rein in their shot list to be really tight because they know for any project, we're only ever going to at the most use eight to 10 images to tell the story. So let's only do eight to 10 images, but let's make them each really good. And if you can do that, then your stress on site is just pretty much gone and you're focusing and having the right amount of time to get exactly what you need for that. But that's a pretty high level of uh commercial photography that's hard to get not hard to get to yeah it's hard to get to um that didn't come until probably five to ten years in where i there there'll be a first few times that you run into people and they're like we're so excited to work with you and you're like really you <laughs> yeah you know like i've trying i've been trying to convince everyone up to this point but and then they're finally like when you zero. start to get people coming to you to to work that's when you know you can put your prices up higher because if you're seeking people saying hey can i come show my portfolio mm, fine you know it, it's it's a different thing like you're not impressive to them at that yeah. point and you'll show them your work and then they'll be like oh <laughs> well maybe we'll let you yeah. try on this not great project that we have a little demo and if you do well at that well uh, yeah, yeah and then when you do that you're like give me the crappiest thing you got and I'll make it look good. That's when they're like, we'll never use anyone else. So with that pricing, um, I know there's so many different like ways that different photographers talk about pricing. I look on YouTube so many times and I'm a beginner for photographer. How have you adapted your pricing plan? Do you have like a strict like this, this, this is like what it is or is it different with every client? Uh, it can be different with every client. It's going to differ depending on usage terms and stuff, like how many entities are going to be able to use those images. So how much do you know about copyright law and and all that, like creative rights and everything? Uh, pretty little. <laughs> pretty little. Okay. So, like watermarking. But... Um, yeah, good luck. <laughs> uh, you you want to be really clear. And it's a pretty simple statement, just kind of with everything you, you want to – the more you can have in writing between business relationships, especially starting out, is better. I, I have one client that, you know, jobs with them can be in the 10 to 20 grand range. Yeah. And there won't be a single penny exchanged in the entirety of it until I send them an invoice afterwards. Hmm. And it's because I've worked with them so much. They trust them. Yeah. It's just a phone caller and it's like, hey, can you be here in August to do this and that? And the amount of money that's going to be exchanged afterwards is huge. And, and it's weird because then I go to do something where there's, I'm buying something or something else of this level. And there's so much technical crap to go through signing and everything else, but you develop these relationships with clients and you just know them. And he's like, yeah, it's fine. Is it like that? Hmm. And that'll bite you in the butt maybe once someday. Yeah. But also like, psych. the ease of 
acquiring work and the flow of it not being too draining on you, if you can rely on the consistency and the trust in that, and it's good for them, and it's you're not mucking up their system at all, as little as I can get towards being technically blah, blah, blah with clients, the better. But okay. on the outset, you got to be very clear about your boundaries because then you're going to start um, incubating clients into a position where they're going to say, but the last shoot, you gave us 30 images. Why can't we do that again? You know, and I was guilty of that starting out. I'd get um, I'd get shoots for main home design okay. and they were, you know, mostly the ones that would say, like, just go do what you do. And so oh. the problem then is like ugh, infinite, you know. Um, and I'm, I'm not good at reining myself in, in that case either. It's like you take one image and you look a little to the right and you're like, well, this would be better if I shifted over there. And then now you're restyling the whole thing for that and relighting. And it's like, you've got two very similar images, but you don't know if one's better than the other really, because you're still new. And so, okay. And you just end up taking a bunch of stuff and then it makes other people look bad, especially if you're good at it and all those images are great. Then the people that are only delivering eight to 10, if they're still working with the same publication, they're like, we're only delivering eight to 10. And they're like, well, Trent's delivering 30. And they're like, screw Trent. He's messing everything up. You know? So there's yeah. this weird, like, you do need to come and talk to people and say, like, what's the standard? What should I do? Like, and I tried to assist other photographers when I first tried to start. And everyone was just kind of like, uh, we don't need anybody. And you know, that's a whole thing that I heard about, like, if you should assist photographers and a lot of people saying, no, you don't need that. That's an old for thing one, you, needed to, you needed to assist photographers before you could become your own photographer. But it's not the case anymore. You don't have to. Uh, and it'll be likely that it's a trap if you're not careful. It's yeah. a trap in that you'll get used to making money in a way that for you could be enjoyable because it's a new experience every day. It's a different place. And the money's like enough to, you know, so why do I, how can I spend all this time? Like you have to, at some point, use the difficulty of life to motivate you, you know, like yeah. just put yourself in that situation where if I don't get work, things are going to get pretty bad. And if you have that consistent, uh, assisting gig, you can feel like you're doing what you're supposed to be doing because you're adjacent to photography but it can also become that, you know, you never get out of your mom's house situation. So, yeah. And so just back to the pricing real quick, as a beginner, like me, how would you in literal terms, I mean, how would you price yourself? I'd, I'd have to look at your work. Okay. Uh, and I'd have to know who the clients are, um, and how established the client is and what they've used in the past but do you do like hourly or do you more like to do Ooh, day do, or project don't do hourly, don't do hourly. Because, and here's why what you're selling is your entire experience again not that hour that hour is meaningless it's your entire life how you conduct yourself what you've experienced what you can see because of what you've seen that is the value and and you you just simply have to charge less when you're starting out because you haven't uh, shown you haven't you haven't perfected or shown that you can consistently do what you want to do, but you're pulling that from all the work of just being alive and surviving as a creative type up to that point. Yeah. So all of life is in that hour for you, and if you're getting paid just for that hour, you're getting pretty shorted. But if you're not proven, you have to accept that all of those things starting out are more of an opportunity rather than a right for you to be paid. So you're saying it's better to be paid for a day and maybe like edited photos? Yeah. Or, or so, that is an entire project? I think so. Edition? I think you should have a creative fee that's okay. maybe attached to like a full day creative fee or a half day creative fee. Keep it, in my opinion, having it within that boundary uh, allows the client to then say, for this shoot, we'd like to move a little faster and not quite be so finicky about the, about the styling or lighting and get a few more images um, than, than other days. And, you know, that gives them a little flexibility to say, we'll get more images out of this, but it's the same rate for that amount of time. Yeah. But the technical delivery they need to understand will be a little bit different if we're trying to do more in, in the shorter amount of time or more in the same amount of time. And as long as you can kind of keep that 
uh, quantity quality balance in there, yeah. uh, and they can understand that then, and that's fine. But you also, you don't want to train a client to start relating to you in a way that you do not enjoy working. So if you have a client that says, well, let's do it in four hours and I want, you know, 30 images, oh which in an hour I could take thousands of images. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a gradient, you know, there's no real like, well, this has to take this long. I can just put the camera there, do a bracket, move on. And if you get it done before the amount of time, then it's even better for you. That's why it's horrible yeah. when they say we're going to pay you for four hours. So then if you do less, if it takes less than four hours, you're like, well, we want some money back because right. you didn't do the whole it's four hours. It's not that kind of situation. And if it takes longer, you eat that, not them. Yeah, that's true. And you know, So that's, that's kind of the boundaries on that relationship that I think are appropriate to say, all right, I'll, I'll, what I'll be giving you is this, these hours of my life. Um, and whatever comes out of it is what we decide is going to come out of it. But you know, we're not doing, you're not going to pay me for one hour when we work four, and you're not going to pay me for one hour when we, or four hours when, you know, we, or you're not going to pay me for one hour when we should have worked four, but didn't because I was good at what I did. You know, it, it's yeah. not about the time involved as much as you're limiting them taking that amount of your time, but you're able to create what you're able to create within that time. And you shouldn't be penalized for being able to do a high level of production within that time. So if you want to arrange yourself to be, I only shoot uh, at a single creative fee, no matter if it's a day or half day, you, mm -hmm. you can do that. It's a little harder to justify. I I go with only half day or full day. And that's what you do. Okay. Yeah, a quarter day is never a quarter day. Does it matter on the site? Do you, does your price change or is it more just, this is what I have for half day, any site, this so I, I whole day? I charge it that I'm, I'll be on site for four hours if it's a half day. If I'm on site for a full day, it's 10 hours. Wow. And yeah. if it's in, in a half day is only like $1,000 less. So it's not like a half day oh, is interesting. half cost. Do they ever give you some, no. like, no? <laughs> like, okay, that's another thing. How do you deal with, like, what's like a lesson you've learned with, with working with clients? And I mean, some annoying clients, <laughs> of course, I know you must have <laughs> experienced some. The, let's see. I know, I, I remember having annoying clients. It's mostly um, small traits of, like sometimes clients will be, uh, prone to not sticking to the shot list where you'll, you'll have this list in front of you. Like, here's the things we got to focus on. So you kind of mentally gauge your time. And then all of a sudden they're like, Ooh, what about this? Or, Ooh, what about that? Mm. And it, that can be hard because it's like, Whoa, wait a minute. I was, you know, we're running a marathon here and I'm keeping pace to yeah. do, you know, to make this checkpoint. And then now they want you to do, all and if all of a sudden things. we're doing a thing here, we're not gonna, you know, um, but overall, like, I, I've never had like a bad client interact. I had one, I had assistant that I didn't use much, but they had put some blinds up in a educational building, excuse me, um, and forgot to put them back down. Oh. These, these are just Venetian blinds yeah. in a professor's office. And this person was livid. Seriously. That the blinds weren't back down. That is absurd. And boy, did this person just go nuts on everyone around him for the blinds not being down. Like, you know, it, and I, I felt, I mean, really, we had, we did nothing wrong. I, and I didn't even put the blinds up or down. Was, and they had just simply forgotten. It was only blinds. And I just felt so bad, though, because, you know, it reflected bad on my client who had gotten us access to be there. And then this person just starts freaking out over, you know. And and it wasn't like she was freaking out about something that you know she was saying. Uh, you guys broke something, or it's it was something that actually you could, you could... just the blinds yeah. not being back down. And that's crazy. And it was just like right, we'll go right back and put them back on. I was like, I already put them back down, you know. And I was like, <laughs> well, all right, wow. we'll get out of here. Yeah. Is you know you just run into some people that really want to ruin your day sometimes, and I've only ever ran into that like once or twice. I know um, it's a big thing, like putting everything back. 
the way it that's was. That's a huge thing. That's How just is that like ever get complicated? Like you have to, you really need to move you something just big cell or cell phone pictures, cell phone pictures and beforehand. Sure stuff goes yeah. back. Okay. Um, and now, most of the time for me now, the clients are there doing all of those things because they're saying, "All right, if we're paying you this, we want you to do exactly what you do, and we'll take care of everything else." Okay. Because it's not going to be uh, financially viable for them for me to come and do all of this stuff and only do what they're paying me for a little bit because I have to do all that. So they'll usually bring people to do all the styling, all the pickup and clean up afterwards. And they'll usually be running around, uh, taking photos and making sure everything gets back where it goes and taking care of that, which, which works really well. I usually tell people if you want to have a really effective day, go and style the entire location the day before. So get okay. rid of all the, you know, personal pictures or clutter or whatever else. So when we come to shoot, it's only moving around a minimal amount of things to then make a great photo. So And do you ever like with like commercial buildings, do you like to have people in your shots sometimes? Cuz I saw this video of this guy actually he was doing an interior design of this um a gorgeous like big I think it was a school and he actually had people move some movement mm -hmm. and longer shutter speed so yep. they you couldn't note it. They were like I don't know. I found the magic shutter Blurry. speed is one tenth if people are just walking at a normal pace. Okay. That that took me like five years. <laughs> <laughs> but it it's yeah. one tenth. Yeah, that's like my lifestyle setting. Um, but that shows them in frame. Shows them in frame, slightly blurred. Slightly blurred. Moving. Okay. If they're moving at a walking pace, yeah. one tenth second will usually be like, yeah, that's pretty good. Like they're not like disappearing, but they're just slightly like you know. Um, and so having people in, I, I usually prefer like just a one or two people to give human scale. Mm -hmm. I just like a cleaner, more minimalist image personally. And are those actors or are those actual people? No, they're usually just people from the architect's okay. office or whatever. I mean, and if you're having difficulty with someone looking like they're thinking about walking, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, just give them their phone and pretend and make them uh, write a text as they're walking because then they'll they'll do what they normally do because they're having to focus oh, on that so interesting. rather than yeah. being watched. Oh, I like when, that a lot. When people are being watched, they behave differently. It's no different than the double slit experiment. We'll get into that later. Um, but uh, yeah, just have them do something that they would typically do while walking. So either talking on the phone or sending a text or as they're maybe standing, talking with someone else, tell them to pretend you're solving a Rubik's cube as you're standing there. So mm. you'll get people look like they're talking with their hands, which is important because a lot of times people will just like, hello, you know, and it's, <laughs> it's weird. So, yeah. Um, yeah. That, so sometimes some people in uh, other times, it's just really nice and clean to not have anyone in, but you know, it, it mostly depends on the client. Yeah. Those, those, just those big buildings, they're just not even intimidating to you at all. And like, how do you, like, I know sometimes on your, they all still fit in a frame. They so also fit into a frame. It's, you yeah. know, there's a vertical element like, okay, what should be over here? What's over there? What can you do? What can't you do? Um, getting now, the thing I will say about a big building is you'll probably want to, uh, cheat your tripod height somehow to match kind of midpoint of the building. If, oh, wow. Is that okay. if you can? Yeah. Um, we had this trick when I had a Honda element that we'd put a massive light stand in the back in the back and put it out the, uh, moon roof that was, that's in mm -hmm. the back of those things. So we'd be driving around New York city with this like gun turret like, <laughs> in the back and we'd have yeah. it like ratchet strapped down on the eye hooks inside. So you had this massive silver post out the top of the thing, but then you get there and you just put the camera on and you're just sitting on top of the car and you just put it up and you trigger it with a iPad or iPhone and you can get, you know, about 20, 30 feet up in the air wow. and it gives you a much better perspective. So you're not like just straight up looking at this very kind of weird. And you're not thing. worried about the camera flying off. As long as you're shooting during the day. Oh no, no, not that you have stuff that locks it in really yeah. well. Um, and if it does, you got insurance. It's not the end of the world. It's just a piece I think of I have technical insurance. gear. Yeah. You should. I should. <laughs> you really should. Here's my story about learning about that. We were shooting uh you've heard of winslow homer artist no from the 1800s you should familiarize himself with oh boy I will. really good artist <laughs> uh but he um he he owned a place up in prout's neck south of portland okay um and there's still a real estate agent in that area by the last name of homer really really uh 
you know, one of the real world famous artists actually from this area. Um, but he had built himself a house that he was going to rent out. And, you know, as artist, he was never really that wealthy while he was living. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but he had this rental house, you know, and we were shooting, we shot both his garage that he lived in and would paint in. But then we were also photographing this house, which like some big record exec or something owned. And this was when I was first ish starting out and I had light stands and we were in the hallway and I'm sitting there looking at these like million dollar pieces of art on the oh wall. God. And I'm just like, oh, wow. And I have the pointy end of the light stand behind me. And I'm holding huh. it, looking at this one. And I'd like step back to get a better look at it. And I'm like, just like, wow, that's really incredible. And I go to turn around to see what's behind me in the light stand, like that far from going through another like million dollar painting. Oh my God. And I had no insurance. I got insurance that day. That That is crazy. Yeah. The, you never think it's going to happen, but for stuff like that, you know, you just got to, and it's peace of mind too. Like if you go and shoot something and then you leave your camera gear in the car and go eat, don't ever leave the cards with the camera. Put them on you. Yeah. Because okay. you can get new camera gear, but you don't want to have to go back and do another shoot. You know, I had no way. <laughs> so, but yeah, get insurance. Okay. Noted. <laughs> insurance. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you use drones ever? Because I just got a drone. Yep. You guys use a drone? Yep. Do yeah. It, it, do you use it or? Yeah. You fly yeah. We have uh, commercial, blah, 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 all that. Uh, getting permission for flying is a lot easier now. Tim always handles it. Uh, it's, <laughs> it used to be really, really difficult. Did to, it? Okay. For specific areas, if you were going to do it commercially with a license and legally, uh, you could put a drone up anywhere and fly it and maybe kill some people. But, you know, to do it legally, usually I don't care about laws that much, but when it comes <laughs> to like obeying the laws because I'm a business acting with yeah. other business, I just won't cross those lines um like we were shooting for a good client outside of a it was a youth detention center and they wanted to get a drone shot of just like 12 feet up in the air which obviously oh. wasn't going to hurt anything yeah but those things know and report to central authority where they're flying and i don't know that they're going to come for me and charge me the 50 grand that they say they will wow and i have friends that hack them and go fourteen thousand feet up with them <laughs> in air traffic patterns seriously just like that's crazy when you can't do this you know kind of my house because i live in portland it's a little annoying because i'm not anywhere near the airport like actually like miles away i know people who will go up some like reason, thousands of feet right under yeah. the airport but for some reason like, it still dude. says airport area oh yeah when it's nowhere it's near a the five mile port. radius i one, think i'm more than five miles really and so i, I well they're they're you can bypass it like a, uh, yeah they're upside down wedding cake that's probably what it is, yeah. Yeah, so it might like, expand yeah, anyway. over there where you might be you, pretty much anywhere now. You can get permission to fly up to like 100 feet. So that's what know? I did. I just fly. I'm like 30 feet above the tree. So it's yeah. no plane, yeah. I hope, is 30 feet above my trees. Right. Like but, you're not going to endanger someone if you're careful, yeah. but you might be in danger from the authorities. So For 50 grand. Yeah. yeah. You, you want to pay attention to that. I don't. I don't mess around with that in the least because I know what can happen if that gets sucked into a jet engine or anything else. And I mm -hmm. just don't, it's not worth it. And like, even at that youth detention center, they just like 12 feet off the ground. I was like, normally I thumb my nose at laws, but not in this case, man, I'm not. Mm -mm, nope. <laughs> wow. So, you know, it, yeah, but that it, it's part of the thing that you have to be able to do now anyways and they're so easy to fly there's just there's nothing to it yeah it was i was very surprised so i got this dji mini 3 because it's like under 249 it's 249 grams so oh, yeah right under the legal limit so i can fly without a license i don't know if you guys have one of the bigger ones uh, i'm using the mavic pro oh yeah that, that one. one yeah yeah that one's big um and i was just like wow i don't know it's because i played video games so i'm like good with controllers but um when i went to um uh north carolina for the, actually the youtube video i just made which was going on the appalachian trail and doing this like week-long backpacking trip yeah which was absolutely gorgeous it was amazing i was with my sister and brother-in-law and um we was just i love the outdoors that's why i, like, I want to like do nature photography and just travel it's like Live in an RV. That's what my youngest son wants to do. He yep. loves it. Yeah. And um, 
just being up on that mountain was like absolutely gorgeous. Sadly, actually, we could not take the drone there because it's a state park and the rangers are like seriously yeah, against they it. They're going to come with their horses and they're going <laughs> to um, get you. But when we came down to like um, further down the mountain to this like park where we could fly it, um, I was just like, wow, this just goes up. This just goes forward. Oh, twist i was like it's just 3d it's space crazy. manipulation that's yeah. it you can just put a camera wherever in space it's not flying it, it's not flying that yeah my son yeah. flies <laughs> planes that he makes he awesome. makes them out of foam core wow. and puts the electronics in and designs them and flies them. oh no kidding that's, that's awesome. flying he's using the principles of staying in the air that's with, true <laughs> but this is four rotors and a computer that you yeah. tell it where to go and You're right. It's like a matrix. Yeah, just... you could put it up there and be like, "Oh no, I forgot to go to the bathroom." Just put the controller down. Go use the restroom. <laughs> come back. It's yeah. still gonna be there. So it. I watched people on the first few jobs that I did. I'd hire people to do drones because I was a little like, oh, "Okay, this oh drones," you know. And they'd come and fly, and I'd watch them, and they'd be all like shaking and stuff. Really? And I was like, oh, "I don't want to do this." Huh. And then I got one, and I and I was like, "This is it." <laughs> Like, <laughs> yeah you know, this is so easy yeah like, what, why did i mm -hmm. pay people yeah it, it's super easy and and extremely safe as long as you're not an idiot and i've know. seen what what's it called when the drones are the fpv ones fpv drones that i got is. one of those you did get one of those how's that so much fun they are is it easier it the, must be much more the hard the cinewoop yeah. one that dji makes the avada oh, never heard of it this thing's so cool yeah it's, <laughs> it's like only about that big and okay. it's got it's super noisy but Oof. it's got four little rotors, uh, but it has like a, a good cage around them. So you can run into something and it just keeps going. Oh, no kidding. But That's you great. fly it through the goggles and you have like just a joystick that you just control it like that and a trigger for um, RPM. So you do still have a joystick. It's not yeah, like mentally. It's, it's like you're flying a jet. Like if they put it, if they put you in a seat with a center thing <laughs> where you're yeah. doing this, like it's full on. Wow, that's what you're, that's crazy. And you can have a setting where you're like doing this, but as you're flying forward, you can look this way and it'll look that way as it's flying forward and then look back. Oh, it, it's insane. It's like really flying in a make believe video game. And it's so fun because you're to turn, you're banking. You're not like turning and going. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> so you're flying forward. Yeah. So it's like this. And if you want to bank you like actually go like that and it like you know it's like it's going on like a berm it's a just like biking. a fighter jet it's yeah. just it's so cool that's and awesome we were out in california and i was playing around with it and i would you know i would just chase things that would drive by <laughs> <laughs> and it's because i'd go like six inches off the ground just like wow. 30 miles an hour you know we we're on this big back road somewhere and it's just so cool because you could just fly in and then you're just like it's like star wars you that know is awesome you're just flying along and then you can <laughs> just all of a sudden like pull off and up and that's so cool and you get the visual of it you're not watching a little drone do it you know it's just is really do cool. you use that on sites at all or not really i would we just haven't had the opportunity yet i'd use it for actually flying through a space is why i like, got like it through a window yeah because i know um my client they wanted me to like fly through a window and i'm like okay i mean i'm gonna test a lot real quick because like it's hard with the with with the dji mini 3 it's like it's almost like you go in sideways in a way i know a lot yeah. of people go sideways yeah. and it just i'm so scared to like hit the window and also it doesn't have that protective cage around right. it you can buy a protection thing you can yeah okay you I'm can buy little plastic things that'll go on they're not as beefy as the avada one but um in even with the maverick i, I would only be worried because the blades are spinning you might mar up some walls yeah or whatever right um but i think you can set a flight course like fly it really slow once and program that course in and then ask it to repeat it and it can do it more quickly oh, seriously there I, I don't know for sure yeah because i don't really get into the technicality of things too much but most of the flying that i do i'm just always kind of finding a flying it myself with the path that you can do these things where you set the interest point and then just rotate around it. And like I use the smokestack out here as a center point to go around. Like helix it. Yeah. And yeah. then so it naturally That's spins, so cool. but then you just give the uh, elevation to it. And so it does like a barber pole thing up. And That's it, so awesome. You know, it's super before drones, man, like y y you saw any footage like that in a movie and you're just like, oh, what a nice movie, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And now it's like, 
yeah, here's the drone footage. Big deal. <laughs> but wow. it's super fun. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're definitely, you have to have that in your arsenal these days, I think. And the ability to do video as well will put you in good stead. And you might get into doing video and respond to that and be like, oh, I love the storytelling aspect of this more than working in this like uh, still frame scenario too. Yeah. So those those could be there. You can definitely express a lot more in a video than a picture. Yes. Or, yeah. or it's easier at least. You can express more, but it's going to be a bigger job. Yeah, There's going to be more people involved. It'll be a longer process. So um, what I do uh, is, is a really really nice balance between time involved money earned um all the way around it's i've i've massaged it to a point where it's really nice for me um but you know I, i'm pretty good at what i do too so i i got to do that yeah but it was not easy you, it took a lot of effort and it took a lot of people trusting me and and supporting me and doing that and everything too so yeah that's it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. And I'm I'm like just getting started, but we'll how, see. How does that feel being your age and in this climate with AI, with all the weirdness of political situations and everything too? Like how's it feel being your age and as much as you can say this today, but being a man that knows that you you are more likely to find your identity in what you do uh, than if you were female. It, it's just a higher 60 to 40 split. You'll have a high degree of your self-worth that comes through identifying with what you do. It's it's just an inescapable, yeah. inescapable psychological reality. So you have this in front of you to say, I need to make something of myself. Am I going to be able to do that? And do you feel like you can with the things at your disposal today? So it's funny because I'm going to bring it back to the English teacher saying right about anything because that's honestly what it feels like. It feels like I have so many things to choose from, so many different photography styles. Mm, yeah. And I don't know what to choose because I know a lot of people choosing wedding photography because it makes the most money. And I'm like... Of course, I want money. Everybody wants to be a millionaire, but weddings can be fun. They can if you have the right personality type. Yeah, and of course, I think I mean I think I'm charismatic, so I think I could. No, no, do you'd pretty be you're successful. You've got the, who's the F1 driver? Uh, Louis Hamilton. You, no, no, no. Ricardo. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you've got a lot of Daniel Ricardo going on, just with your smile, your charm, and your looks are very like people gravitate to that dude, no matter what. Awesome. And you'd make a great wedding photographer. Um. But, you know, do you enjoy doing that? Exactly. So it's, it's do I enjoy it's Do I want to enjoy something or make money? And of course, enjoy and make money is the best that and. Right. But I don't know how much I would like to do wedding photography. You also need to know that no matter how much you enjoy it, if money becomes dependent on execution of that thing, you will lose part of the enjoyment of it. Exactly. So if yeah. to take surfing, for example, I, I love surfing. It's a pretty, it kind of formed most all of my life. The ability to be able to go and surf. I got to ask for some tips, by the way. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, you have to have a livelihood that's flexible enough to be able to go when you need to go, especially mm -hmm. if you live on the East Coast. Yeah. Because waves only happen at very narrow windows. Yeah. West Coast, it, like everyone just kind of lightly surfs. East Coast, you have to be a surfer to get any to get to any level where you have the respect of people who actually know what they're doing. It's it's more difficult on the East Coast. Um, so that kind of forms a lot of the people I run into surfing. They have jobs that allow for the flexibility and schedule, and it's intentional because of this addiction to surfing. Right now, in that there is this guy Andy Irons years ago that um, he and his brother were insane talents. Uh, but I watched them fall out of professional surfing because they just got bored with it. <laughs> no kidding. Well, wow, they're that good, or the they no, just... it it what they were doing was that they were trying to please others by doing the thing that they used to love. Mm, that hobby turned into it was just pure needed. grind. Yeah. Okay, so it it wasn't any more like oh my goodness, I want to go surf because when you hit the water, that cool feeling and then the sun and the, you know, 
it was like, if I got to get out there and I got to get two waves to the beach where I get at least an 8.7 and this, and if I don't, I'm going to lose that contract and blah, blah. It just becomes a completely different thing foreign to, to how you related to it before. Right now I've never lost that with surfing because no one, I'm not good enough for anyone to, you know, put their name on me on a surfboard. It's not going to happen, <laughs> but not with that um, attitude. in, uh, in, in teaching my kids to surf, I've lost some of what I got from surfing because it's become work in a way. Now there's mm -hmm. this joy of passing on this thing that's amazing and great that I now see my kids gravitate towards and they love yeah, doing it, which is awesome. like, absolutely, I'm going to do that. But I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I haven't lost a part of it in doing that because it used to be that I could go and do that and forget about everything. Now, when I go and do it, I have to worry about sharks. I have to worry about how they're doing, how they got their wetsuit on. Are, are they okay? Mm. Are they like all of a sudden now I'm bringing all this different thing with me when I go to do that. I am more than happy to lose that in giving that to them. But if I lose that in trying to earn money, that's a completely different thing. Yeah. You know, and anything you enjoy doing as it becomes dependent on money, you will lose part of the enjoyment. Eventually. I, I hate that. But so if you're long. an artist, if you can separate yourself from the financial part of it and just do the art that you do, then you have a different situation. Okay. There's a lot of like with this podcast, I've never once looked at anything to do with any uh, analytics, nothing ever at all. <laughs> all those graphs. Because I just enjoy being able to have planes flying really low. That's weird. It must be going in Portland. Hmm. Um, but <laughs> I really enjoy like one-on-one -on -one conversations about real things, not yeah. surface level, whatever. Right? Exactly, going deep. Yeah, and, and to me, this is like really, really valuable. And I'm, and I'm excited to talk to someone who's in my spot 20 some years ago. That's, that's stinking cool because I went through that and and I made it. And it was not easy, but somehow I made it. And if I can help others do that, this this ability to exist in this way and to give to your children, like, or you know, give to people in need around you, or to to be able to enjoy in what you do and be an inspiration to others to be able to enact that in their life, it's just far more valuable than getting more money to hoard. You know, yeah. But at the same time, there's this weirdness that you do have to protect that income, the two. It, so it's this weird kind of. It brings me back to like, I wish money didn't exist. It's like I used to always be like, I wish money didn't exist, and then people would be like, You can wish all you want. Like, but there's you mean communism. I'm like, wait, no, not <laughs> communism, but <laughs> human nature, man. It that you know, there's all this talk about the. I get it that the. Here's an interesting thing. I don't know how deep I could go with all that, but <laughs> the as you make laws to remove social shaming for morality that societies felt should be there, uh, but then we make laws to prevent the shaming that kept the society and the culture in line to a degree, but were maybe evil in some ways too. As you make the laws, the culture then expands and loses in some ways the valuable things that that cultural shaming was protecting. Now, this is a, this is a minefield to even say, but <laughs> if you look at, um, and, and there's three different things to look at that are, that are interesting and are each, two of them are similar, one of them's different. This might be totally off topic, but hey, if you get canceled, then you don't have to worry about money anymore. There you go. <laughs> because you won't get any. <laughs> but and and I don't I don't think this is evil or or negative towards anyone at all. There's just something in the creation of laws that is both good and bad. That that you have to you have to admit that there's okay, now that we're protecting things with this law, you also have to look at what is going to be lost with that. So if you take, um, uh, not feminism, but in the emancipation of women is not the right term either, but with, with the movement towards not men, not being able to beat women and women being able to vote known properties, these are all like, 
Well, duh. Yeah, of course. Basic human rights. Like basic human rights. Yeah. Yes. And and I fully agree that these laws should be in place because I 100%. Yeah. Okay. Um, by making these laws that say women can do whatever they want, just like men. Okay, great. Absolutely. I agree with that. 100%. Now, the thing that changes in the culture when you do that, if you're not careful, is that you start to imply that um, there's the people that are receiving the thing that you value most in the culture, the people that are receiving those things from the culture, uh, we should all emulate that. The problem then is what are we emulating? We're emulating CEOs, very top of the tier business owners. Those people are not great people to live with. They're not. Anyone who's effective outside of their immediate sphere is able to do so by what they don't give in their closest needs, right? So if I were to be a world famous photographer that, you know, or, or anything else that was highly regarded outside of who I really am mm -hmm. would pull so much of me away from the people who need me most. I, I can't be world renowned while also being a world renowned father. Where's my value oh, structure? Of course. It, it's yeah. going to stay with my kids. I'm it a sacrifice something yeah. or not fully sacrifice, but it's um, not a absolute given. But yeah. if I'm that successful, I'm probably pulling from somewhere to be that. And okay? the sad part is like a lot of these CEOs and these people, they they go too much with the 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 money. Then I don't know if you've seen these new like documentaries about Elton John and um the new one about um what was it? Elvis. Did you see that? Oh, the movie on Elvis. The movie on yeah. Elvis. I mean, Very cool. Just uppers it's just, and downers exactly. that just and it's juice like, the money. His agents out of him. like not caring about his actual oh, no. like, health. No. It's just money, money, money. money, money it's money. like Yeah. We're humans. Like you might be way more famous than me, but we're still humans. We still we're all eighteen. We're still, you know, all these right. things. So So the the point I was trying to make here is that the by making laws to protect the evils that were happening to women, the thing that um, not directly intended that came with it was this change in our culture to think that there should be two spouses working outside the home because it was possible, much more possible now. And then just with World War II and everything, there was a shift of people working in factories, women working in factories yep. where they would. So all the norms of the past that, worked towards keeping a little bit more of a nuclear family were done away with. Uh, just that the idea becomes like, you're not limited to staying in the home anymore. You can do whatever you want. And then second comes in the expectation of like, well, why aren't you out there getting that money? Well, I'm not out there getting that money because I actually, I value spending time with my family and providing a beautiful place for our family to That's be close. That's more than any currency can. And I mean, right. you talk to people outside of American culture and they will value the woman as the most valuable part of any family to be the last person that would die in any situation that protect that at all costs, you know? But we, we just take that, the most valuable part of a family, and we just throw it out into the workforce and go do the most valuable thing, go earn money. And then you get this culture that tells you you're more valuable working outside of the home. And if you stay in the home, you just work at home. And the the value of those close relationships, I mean, and, and it can totally be a guy that stays home and the woman goes and work. Yeah. I'm not saying that there's roles that have to be within lines here. Are you it's saying one parent a, should be at the home though? I Personally, be the... I believe that one parent should be in charge of creating a space where a family knows this is us and and it is valuable and we put work into this i think yeah. that's extremely valuable now i think of course best 60... case is both parents can do that's the best case scenario but it can't Not... really happen i i don't know that i agree with you completely there interesting okay I, if two people were home trying to do the same thing i found that if you try and start a business with two people who want to do the same thing within a business there's too much conflict if you have a diversified approach, I'll go handle this, you handle that, great. 
I've run into plenty of people where the guy stays home and takes care of everything. And he's just like a man of the home and he's <laughs> building stuff and, you know, and she's out like lawyering and engineering or whatever. And that it works or it's switch. Now, the reality is that 60% of the time, the person that's going to have the emotional dispositions towards creating a good home environment will be the woman. Sixty mm percent -hmm. of the time, it'll be the man who's more likely to find their identity outside of the home, but that's just a sixty forty thing, and that's not even that big, you know. But now we have this culture that came along with the laws that says, "Go do the thing that we value most: go earn money." Now you get two people working outside of the home; they can afford more. Mortgage rates go up, cost of living goes up, everything goes up. You're more likely to go in debt. You're more likely to just be running ragged the whole time. I'm, I sound like a conservative stump speech here, but, um, and the, the negative effect there was that we start to turn towards what we improperly value as the most valuable thing, just simply money at this point, which is a fiat currency, which means nothing. It's just nothing. It's just pieces of paper that other people respect in exchange that you then get freedom. It right? honestly shows that it's nothing with all of Bitcoin as well, which is a whole nother thing. But like, I mean, I know some of my <laughs> friends were, they like made a, they made their own uh, di uh, digital coin. Yep. It wasn't Bitcoin, but they were like, okay, everybody buy our coin. We're like, you can just, I, that was when I first realized like, wow, anybody can literally make, right. it's not like it's going to work. But yeah, that's like, when you just tell them that no profit is accepted in their hometown. <laughs> exactly. But, I'll um, buy that Bitcoin when uh, Steve Jobs or, you know, whoever. Right, but um, yeah, just having that re like reliance on currency and money and everything being like interest, everything or inflation, everything going up. It's yeah. just it. It does scare me a little bit that I'm pressured to not pursue what I want to pursue and pursue what I economically should have should pursue instead mm. of what I feel like is the right thing. Versus right. Whether I should hold, get more money. Hold on to that. What you think you should and what you want to. Yeah. Let me finish my point before I get canceled. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the the idea is that the the by bringing in laws to eliminate social shaming or just downright evil practices that were happening. Like there's laws that said you could have beat your wife if it was something not thicker than your thumb kind of stuff in like Tennessee, mm. you know, just horrendous stuff. Right. But laws come in to protect that. So then the, the general cultural expectation can shift towards an, an exaggeration of like, go earn money. Right then you lose this the, the importance of the family and the value of actually valuing someone to take care of that and to provide that. You know, we just need money and then we can have everything we want. Well, everything you want can't be bought. You know, some of the most valuable things are there's no price on them. It's the choice. You get to choose to take that time rather than pay for that mm -hmm. time. You can never buy it. So unless you work and whatever. So there's that. Right. And the thing that we found in Scandinavia, they've been more equal uh, with as far as the ability for equality rather than a forced expectation. So Scandinavia does not have policies that say we need 50 percent men, 50 percent women in this field, 50, okay. 50, 50, 50. That's called equality of outcome rather than equality of opportunity. Scandinavia's had the most equality for opportunity for the longest. And the social scientists expected that what they would find is an evening out to 50-50 in all fields. The exact opposite happened. They gravitated mm. towards social norms or psychological norms based on like a 60-40 split of common uh, female interests to male interests and blah, blah, blah. And my parents noticed that this when they were there. It was just far more uh, young women out and about pushing baby strollers, ha everyone happily doing their thing, that like a society that does not shame you for one or the other, that you get a natural choice towards what you actually feel called to do, rather yeah. than a society telling me you're most valuable if you go earn money. So this is, that was a weird this is thing. really interesting because this brings me into this like, crazy debate where do you think this could be in workplace as well but really with colleges like 
where they say we are going to split up our admissions to this amount of this like ethnicity and this people and these this sex and I, and to me personally like before i hear your opinion i just want to say like well yes we should be very inclusive if it's like a very like esteemed college you should just look blindly at the straight statistics you should be like well this student is qualified this student as students not as like right this woman from i don't know canada or this guy from like asia you know like different it's just like oh if you're if you're asian you're less likely to get into harvard because they'll look for you to have a higher gpa exactly and things like which that which is like, like blown away what? the fact that how does that make any sense morally legally i i wonder if they base that policy off of they they're just across the board they're going to have a higher propensity for passing these tests because they've just got their schooling and everything down and mm -hmm. they you know they maybe they recognize that like you guys aren't any more intelligent but they're producing a higher level of intelligence in your culture so we're going to filter your culture to which is to like, like give a cheat for discrimination our, yeah i i don't really understand that i also can't get too critical about that because i don't know enough about it okay but it certainly seems like it should absolutely be a blind like do you have the gpa or like on yeah on very materialist views of like, these are our standards, either meet them or don't. And in if you feel like you've been, you're a victim and you can't meet these standards, well, I'm sorry, but that's not our place to do that for you. I don't, I don't know what to do, but we're not going to lower the standards of this institution to manage someone who's been given a short shake on something. I, but at the same time, if you look at a population that's under-resourced, uh, you know, the black population in America being against their will, stolen from another country, brought here, and then all of a sudden made free. And when they did that, that I think the proposal was 40 acres and a mule, and you had a really intense progression of black wealth and everything else happening. And I think there was a response from the white or white Southern population, I'm not sure, um, that was just kind of like, all right, hold on. They're doing too good. Like we got to rein these guys in cause they're going to get mad at what we did and we're going to be toast or I don't know what happened there, but to, to look at, a a population that has been for generations unfairly, uh, minimized and, and subjugated is, is something that you have to acknowledge and accommodate. I don't know how to do that. One thought is that, you know, because they, they talk about reparations, they being just the general, not they, they, them, you know. Um, if, if I were to be thinking along the lines of reparations, it's never a good idea to just simply give something to someone that they haven't earned. But if you give someone the opportunity for them to step into, then they're doing it themselves. And you're not going to spread yeah. freedom by tearing governments down and, and installing democracy. A country has to earn their own freedom else. They don't value it. And that's what happened in Afghanistan. As soon as we left, they were like, here's the arms. Yeah, no, you guys are fine. You know, it was just gone like that. You know, mm -hmm. it's ridiculous. We should not it's be crazy. doing stuff like that. But if you look at reparations, before you even get to the difficulty of how do we decide who gets this? Because, well, you're one sixteenth and you're one twenty fourth and you're a <laughs> hundred in like, how are you going to do that? You yeah. know, like, is it a skin tone test? Like you can't that I, I don't I'm sure someone has an idea of how to do that. But if you said, look, for three generations, any like if this is specifically a reparations towards the injustice on the black population. All right. All uh, all people who are can, uh, you know, apply for this all black owned businesses untaxed for the next three generations. All, all people who can apply for this are get free education for the next three generations. Okay. The amount of self accomplishment, self drive, self empowerment of the black community to do it themselves, not with a bunch of help from these whining Karen leftists, <laughs> but actually like, like, here you go we all know you're more than capable of doing whatever you want. And yeah, we're really sorry about our shitty ancestors that did this. Here's the opportunity. Yeah. Can, like, 
that would mean a shift of business ownership like you've never seen before because you'd have white owners of businesses going like, can you own our business and we're going to pay you a percentage because if you own it, then there's no tax. And you get, you'd get, you have all these things <laughs> of stuff like that happening, but then you'd also have like, you're not taking anything away from any current population to be upset about. So, okay, there's like my concerns off the table. Like for what my ancestors did, I don't have to pay for, but they shouldn't be having to pay for what happened to their ancestors. So mm -hmm. why don't we create an opportunity between those two things to say totally tax-free, totally free education for the next three generations. And maybe there's, you know, loans that go along with that that are zero interest and everything else. Then you're going to have a bunch of white business owners being like, we would love to give you money and work with you. We'd love to give you money and work with you. I mean, there's ways of doing these things that are not that difficult. It wouldn't seem, but power structures, once they have profit channels, are very unlikely to change. Yeah. And I don't know why I started talking about this, but <laughs> where? how did we get here? How did we get anywhere? Let's be honest. Conversations just... That's what I love. <laughs> just when it just flows. This, yeah, this is, this is two uh, open individuals just like, yeah, I want to talk about it because this is interesting. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so photography, though, yeah. <laughs> photography, I mean, I got a lot from the man himself. Like, <laughs> like I was saying, you were like, oh, it's great, like, talking to somebody, like, 18 year I'm like, well, it's great to talk to somebody who's literally, like, what I want to be doing. Yeah, um, I, I never really had that opportunity. So, it, I'm, I constantly, if anyone approaches me, especially if it's through someone that I know or talked to before, I'm much yeah. more likely to, do you know the ladies at Bowerbird there? Or? Yeah, so I talked to Laura. And um and Liz Moss. Yep. Um and they were like, Oh, this guy. And I was like, Oh, okay. So sure. okay. Laura gave me your number and I was like, What's up? And you said howdy, that's when I knew. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Just he, he's weird. a real surfer. <laughs> What's up, <Yeah>. bro? <laughs> Very informal. So you want to get into surfing or are I do want to get into so I um uh Laura's husband, Charlie, actually, he's a surfer. Yep. And he got me into surfing a little bit. I went to Hawaii recently, just this past summer in um, Oahu, not the other islands, and it was insane. And I surfed a little bit. Um, I, I could only catch like one or two waves, and all these other people were just flying. And I, were I was, you like at Waikiki? Or? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, you know, first of all, I loved how like at 5 a.m. I went on like a run, and they were just like all like 50 surfers already out there. I was like, how the hell oh, yeah. did you get out there? Um, but yeah, I just think the sport is really cool cool and just being i love water like i scuba dived i got my scuba diving license and so i just love water and i want to be able to surf and the times i've tried haven't really worked i know it, in hawaii it's be better, like in, in the hawaii it's better than the time. east i know I mean, i'm sure you've been to long island to surf uh, i haven't no okay because that's where we're planning on surfing apparently there's good waves near montauk so yeah it with the east coast you just have to have have a really keen eye on the weather yeah. and the systems that are generating swell um, on the East Coast. It's going to be very hard to learn and track that. But if you just watch Surfline and it, as long as it's above three feet, there's usually mm -hmm. you just want some offshore winds and about three feet, you'll be able to get some business done. Awesome. How long did it take you? Like, how did you get into surfing? Um, Your parents or? I, I lived in Ohio when I was a kid for a few years. And I remember seeing, uh, you know, like they'll have you cut things out of a magazine and put them in a collage oh, yeah <laughs> like maybe that's an ancient yep. thing no no, no they do that they do it all the time so and right in the middle of it was this big old barrel and some guy riding in the barrel and then down cool. to the left was like a machine awesome. gun like you know boy stuff <laughs> and uh but i always remember just having that fascination with it we would we started going on vacation to the outer banks of north carolina yep and i saw people surfing there in virginia beach and i was just like must do must do and the for the people that really get into it, it becomes uh, like you're either 100 percent in or it's just like, oh, that was fun. Yeah. And for me, it was just like a complete. It's really great because if you're a surfer, Christmas is always just two weeks away. Mm. Because that's how the weather works. Interesting. Yeah. You know, so like there'll be waves and there's like, yes, and then they're gone and you're like, I'll get some stuff done. <laughs> when are the next waves? And yeah. it's like, ooh, looks like in the forecast, like a week out, there'll maybe be something. So 
I'm just going to get a bunch of work done here. And then I know that that's coming. And, and it's kind of like a, a will outside of you to help you manage, like focus on having fun playing. It's not here now. Get work done. Yeah. And then go back to that and then go back to that. It's funny that you mentioned OBX because me and my friends are actually going to go down there for our trip. Yeah. And we found these awesome Airbnbs and nobody was going to rent to 18 year olds. And we were mm -hmm. like, shit. <laughs> so we had to just need a tent, place. dude. A tent. I want to go camping, but they don't. Guys, if you're listening to this, <laughs> you made a big mistake. We could have. You guys are pan pan <laughs> is pansies an offensive term. You're flowers. Oh, there you go. Um, no, I, I lived out of my car in the Outer Banks for oh, yeah. five summers. I'd work at the Froggy Dog oh, at nights God. and uh, you surf loved it? all day. Oh, yeah. I did that when I was 17 till 21 or whatever. Um, that actually just sounds like the life. <laughs> well, what did you do not in the summer? Um, I'd have to go to school. <laughs> oh, yeah. When <laughs> Back when I was young. Um, but that, as a 17-year-old, I cannot believe my parents let me do that. I, mean, I just talked to a bunch of other friends into like, hey, I, I want to go down there and really learn to surf because you need to be within a, like a five minute proximity to where you can surf if you're going to be a surfer. Yeah. If, if it's more than that, it's just highly likely that you'll miss everything. It, it's odd. I mean, five to 10 minutes. But um, I worked that out and it was weird because I was 17 years old and all of a sudden this just wide open horizon of, of adventure and unknown and I had to manage it all on my own and show up to work on time don't lose your job learn how to you know manage your money what little money you have and it it was just so incredible and the the freedom and the and the the ability and the time to be bored which no one has anymore because we have phones which is a really bad thing but <laughs> that that ability to actually get lost and disappear yeah that's not capable now it was just you found yourself in that so much. And yeah. it it's odd because it's set up the whole rest of my life, that one choice of choosing to go there, just live out of my car, surf during the day, work at night. And the the cycle of that and learning that I, I could dream up something and do it was mm. very empowering. And then after that, I went and I worked as a high school teacher for two years in the Marshall Islands, which was some of the best time of my life as well before having a family. Um, and that was just out in the middle of the Pacific on a little atoll. I mean, just wow. massive, that's awesome. Massive tiger sharks in the water, deadly waves and crazy <laughs> reef. But it was just, yeah, it was, it was amazing. And it, you know, do you just, get afraid of the sharks at all? Yeah. All the time. You do? Yeah. <laughs> You'll never get yeah. rid of that. Cause I, like I, 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 of course I watched Jaws when I was a kid and the whole Jaws sure. morphia, whatever it did. <laughs> and that actually didn't scare me. I, I don't know why that movie never scared me. And I, I actually love sharks. So when I went scuba diving, there was this, like great, uh, white tip reef shark. And I like went to try to touch it, but like it went away from me. And that's when I was like, that's when I really knew like I wasn't afraid of it. And it might have been because it was white a white tip. Nothing. I know that's why it might have been because of the white tip reef shark, and it wasn't a great white or tiger shark. So I was. And it's also because I didn't look like a seal with a with a whole big like surfboard under me that makes me look like a white, animal. They can white eat. tips are like house cats. Yeah. <laughs> sharks, sharks are like lions. Yeah. That's, they're the same thing, just at different scale. And like your house cat will eat you if you're small enough. They don't give two about. If you were that big, you'd be dead. Now, if your dog saw you shrink down to that side, they're like, oh, no, who's going to feed me? <laughs> but, yeah, it. I remember in the Marshall Islands, like, just going out and snorkeling over the reef where we'd surf, and the, the water level would go out over the reef gradually down to about where it was six feet deep, maybe, and then yeah. it dove down to about 20 feet deep and oh, then wow. gradually went out for maybe like here to the building from the shore out there. Oh, no kidding. Okay. And there it went continental shelf down. Like just a drop. Abyss. That, like, that actually terrifies me. One time well, I was like just walking around. It might have actually been in Hawaii, one of the other beaches. And we're just, no, it was, it's, I couldn't see the water. I couldn't see through because Hawaii was clear, yeah. but it was somewhere. I'm just walking and then boom, I just like fall through. I was like, what just happened? Why can I not stand here? Yeah, yeah. Well, there the water is crystal clear and you could see everything. That's but good. Yeah. we'd we'd snorkel out there and like the 
gray reef sharks are the ones you have to worry about as far as reef sharks. Okay. But then we'd have white and black tip sharks. Now, oceanic white tip, you'll only see once and then you'll be dead. They eat whatever they come across. <laughs> but um, but we'd be out there snorkeling and you'd see, like, I saw a manta ray, the big, big oh, ones. Oh, wow, those are gorgeous. He came up off the shelf just for a second and then just back down. Like, you just all of a sudden, like, Emerge from the this depths. This massive plane size thing. Just you're just like, you know, and That's he good. Yeah. one flap <laughs> and he back down just disappears. Yeah. And it's like you saw this giant out of the deep all of a sudden. That That's was so, so funny because cool. I feel like at least what, what I've heard from my surfing documentaries, people are like, Hey, you're one with the sharks, but you're like, hell no, these <laughs> things are scary. They can eat me. Um, I, I mean, everyone's different, yeah. but I mean, we'd be out snorkeling and as you're coming in, you'd turn around and the sharks would be coming up on your flippers. And oh, as no soon kidding. as you make eye contact with them, they bolt. Oh, you got to really watch your back. It, it wasn't that they were coming to try and take a bite out of you, but they're but like they dogs yeah. in that they're like kind of uh. going to sniff. And then you, they see eye contact. They know that. And then they're just boom, you know? And I had this one experience where I saw this probably six foot reef shark. He kept coming up at this one spot and going down at another spot, coming like he was mm -hmm. stuck in a loop. <laughs> oh my God. And so I, I had this, um, what do they call them? It's just a big rubber band on a stick with three metal prongs at the end. It's like spear gun. Oh, spearfish. You're yeah, spear but it's, they call it a specific something. It's not oh, like a spear okay. gun. It's a, I don't know. But, uh, and I had that and I was like, oh, I'm going to go over there and, and watch where this shark comes up. And I was literally about here to that blue chair, just or green, whatever it is. <laughs> and I like had the thing fully stretched and you could shoot this thing into a door or this, a tree and hang on it. It like had some oh my power. God. Yeah. And so I'm sitting there and got it cocked and I'm waiting for the shark. I wasn't, I wasn't planning on hitting him. I just wanted to get close and see him because I knew he was going to come up there again. As soon as he comes up, he turned towards me and put his, fe his fins down in attack mode. And because I surprised him, I guess. And as soon as I saw that, I just panicked and let the thing go. It sounded like, and fell to the ground when it hit him. It hit him? Yeah. Oh my like God. Like full broadside, like no he was kind of like doing this and looking at me and it's just, and like, boom. And I was like, oh my goodness. And, it, and it, as soon as it hit him, it freaked him and he took off. It didn't get through, it didn't impale Did him. not impenetrate nothing. And I was what just like, heck? whoo. <laughs> and that was just the fact a that it did not. I yeah, I don't know if it's scarier if the fact that he was about to get you or the fact that I your spear gun didn't or I don't know if he would have anything. attacked me or not but it was definitely an, an alarming all of a sudden yeah. situation um I've been chased out of the water by tiger sharks seriously big, one, big ones yeah not oh I, he wasn't coming for me but it was like from here to the window yeah. and he we we're out at magic island to the north of Waikiki I think and it was like a 12 foot wave and there's this massive tiger shark with his dorsal fin sticking out of the wave, riding the wave like a dolphin, hmm. not like full on, but yeah. like he was gliding along with it for a second and he could have taken a right and come for me, but he took a left and went the other way. And I kind of like cleaned my board shorts out and went in very quickly. <laughs> but yeah. that's the biggest shark I've ever seen in person. But wow. like around here, if you run into a shark, they're going to be a big one. It's, yeah. Yeah. There's, I heard like some great whites were around this area. And I was like, what just the Just up around Portland, a woman was bitten completely yeah. in half a couple summers ago. I and I was out of... the weekend before on our little dinghy in that area. And I just all that of a sudden freaked got you out. panicked. Like I was, it was me and my two boys around Eagle Island in Casco Bay. We're on the ocean side and all of a sudden the water's just black under you. And you can tell like this is really deep. And it's just a little fabric yeah. inflatable thing. Oh, my and I was God. just going along and I was like, something all of a sudden spooked me. And I was just like, Wah! and we turned right around, went back to the boat. And like that next weekend, that woman got bit in half. Oh, like, wow. That's crazy. Yeah. I'm, I don't know if I like had some spidey sense or what, but I didn't see anything. I didn't nothing. But I was just like, this is creeping me out. Good call. That's crazy. But I, I, anytime I'm out surfing with my kids, I'm just constantly looking for sharks. It just freaks me out. But I'm probably more than most people. And if you so. see one, is that your cue? Like you're done? Or do you sometimes give it a chance? Oddly, I've seen a shark fin in the water and looked around and no one else did anything. So I was like, eh, all right. <laughs> and then you see drone footage. They're all over. Yeah, that's when I was like, what the hell? I saw yeah. these like drone footage over some crystal clear water. I was like, there's a fin here, fin here, fin here, yeah. fin here. I was like, and it's it, again, honestly pretty, it's, but it's not I wasn't the, in the water. To... It's not the little ones that you got to worry about, really, unless you're in Florida and you're going to get like 
flesh wounds. But, Mm -hmm. you know, around here, if you encounter a shark, it's probably one that's, you know, going to take a significant tax. (laughs) Oh, I hate that. But what are you going to do? Not go in the water? Yeah. That's not really a choice. (laughs) No. (laughs) Got to go for it. So, yeah. But, yeah, if, if, you know, the advice is to just, if, if you love it, you won't need advice. So, yeah. If you end up loving it, um, make sure you get the right kind of wetsuit. Uh, start out with a bigger board, okay, and start big and like twice a year, maybe gravitate towards a little bit smaller board if you're able to do it consistently. Interesting, because when I snowboard, I I always like smaller ones because yeah. they can turn faster. Yeah, Plus, this that'll be a detriment for yeah. trying to learn because yeah. with a snowboard you can just start at the bottom and get the ability to attempt what you're doing the entire way down with surfing you have to first paddle yourself out there there's yeah. no lift and that can be really difficult at times like i'm out of shape right now and i was kind of <laughs> sore um and then your amount of time on a wave especially around here is going to be extremely short yeah so go to higgins and just catch the white water and ride that'll be your closest thing to uh to Waikiki and just ride, go straight. And once you're up, just kind of like, all right, I'll try and go right a bit. I'll try and go Hmm. left. And then next time, try and catch the wave before it's white water and then go with the direction that the white water is breaking, try and go that way. And, and just the best thing you can do big is like start out with a longboard and just slowly graduate down. You need to know that, that there's a lot of territorial, like, society could fall apart and surfing will be the same. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) So you will get punched in the face if you do the wrong thing. Yeah. And it's... Don't go on somebody's turf when they're surfing. Yeah. I mean, there's not a lot of places around here that are like that as much, but if you run across a place where there's only a few people out and it was a hard place to get to, you're probably going to get some... Someone's going to wax your car, yell at you, run you off, maybe. Wow. Um, But... Also, if you come alone and you're respectful and you never uh, are bringing anyone else and they they have every impetus to say, give this guy a chance. If he's going to be respectful, we're not going to bother him. Now, if they're real a-holes, they'll bother you. But That's crazy. The, the gentleman's agreement is like, come alone if you're coming somewhere new. Uh, wait your turn. Don't don't be overly aggressive and and you'll be fine. Oh my gosh, it was horrible in Waikiki. It was like that 80 people. Yeah. That's like an extreme scenario, but there's literally like eight people on one wave, and this one paddleboarder was like destroying everybody. It was actually yeah. hilarious. He was like riding the wave, and it was actually pretty impressive. But I just saw like like this like novice person. Like I went into my own little area. I try to at least. And I just saw this one person like totally steal this guy's wave, and he got pissed. And I was oh, like, yeah. Yeah. Like that's crazy. I've trained my kids pretty well. They know how to work a lineup and uh that's good. They've taken a lot of people by surprise. (laughs) They'll, you know, they'll look at a kid and they'll drop in on him. And and I've trained my youngest son who's really aggressive. I've I've trained him to just be like, excuse me. (laughs) And so they'll be like, (laughs) No kidding. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, yeah, it's a it's an interesting sport because it maintains itself. Um, in that sense. And it, and it's funny because with the newer generation, I, you, you do start to see people who are getting into it, who come across as very entitled, like, I'm just going to come out here and take whatever I want and try whatever I want because I'm entitled to whatever I want. And, and to see that play out in the water is pretty funny. <laughs> it, it, yeah. It's not how it works. It, the, the ocean is such a regulator on its own that, that kind of attitude um, really gets you in a tight spot eventually, not even from a human perspective, but the ocean will put you in your place so quickly. So wow. it, yeah, yeah. It, it's a really great thing to have in your life um, as just physical fitness, the encouragement, the, the time alone, the time to think, the, the things that you learn f- by interacting with something that's 100% unpredictable. Mm-hmm. That's, and the other thing is you're, you're interacting with kind of the purest translation of pure energy into matter. That, that water is not actually moving. The water molecules stay behind as the wave passes through it. The thing that's moving is the energy through the water. Hmm. 
and the molecules of water kind of move, but they still are here. Oh, are you that kidding? Way. That's crazy. I mean, it's not like this water is traveling oh, all the know. way from Africa where this swell started. Yeah. It's the energy moving through the element. So like right huh. now, you're hearing sound waves from me. That's going through. But it's not matter of air. The particles of air didn't move from here to you for you to be able to hear it. It bounced off of every air particle between here and there and that's what is happening with the waves in the water yeah it's just you can see them because they're bigger and they line up and yeah and so that learning to capture and and move with that energy is is uh if you think about it is a is a pretty deep uh process that you know unfortunately i'm not that graceful and it, it looks very <laughs> clumsy at times and blah 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 but it's just it's that like infinitely novel thing. There's, you never get enough. Yeah. So it's, it's addictive. Yeah. And for a personality that's open for me, it's like, I never know what I'm getting and it's never the same. So that's definitely that's, one of the better things to be addicted to. Well, that's, yeah. That sounds it, awesome. Yeah. It's can't wait. I'd highly recommend it. <laughs> Is there like a, like a, a, a website that you use for surfing? Like, that you can like see when forecasting the next thing, yeah, for forecasting. There used to be Magic Seaweed. Unfortunately, they were bought out by Surfline, and now like this okay. is just in the last week. I'm currently like wonder what the waves are going. Ah, crap. Mm. So if you just get a Surfline membership, oh, it is a membership. Yeah, oh, that's a yeah. shame. Yeah, I don't know though. I think you can probably get like a five day, three five day forecast for free. But then if you're getting like a two week, what to look for? Because yeah. you're lurking to like, do I want to schedule a work around that time? yeah okay it's yeah. my second calendar i check <laughs> <laughs> that's great <laughs> so are you busy that day let me check both my calendars yeah. <laughs> yeah but yeah it uh i'd highly recommend it and it uh making a living as a photographer allows for that but it also when you do have work you can't get out of it yep. as well whereas if you have the desk job and flexibility at least you suck most of the time but when there's waves you get freedom but you yeah know, i'd i'd take my situation currently so <laughs> there you go any other any other good questions you got for um what's the best food place around here because i'm starving <laughs> uh, let's see what kind of food do you like um sandwiches paninis or sandwiches or Let's see, there's there's Magnus on the Water down here to start at the lower end of Main Street that is really good, supposedly. I've never been there, and I don't think they're probably open for lunch. Up okay. from there, you have uh, Q Hong, which is a Vietnamese restaurant. Interesting. That is that is really good. Today's Monday? Today's Monday, All yeah. Right. You're going to be <laughs> short on options. Okay. Um. The Let's see, up from there, there's Aldo or something... There's a little cafe place that does have sandwiches and stuff that has just like a round bulb with a rabbit on it outside over here. Interesting. Uh, there's the rotisserie place kind of right across from that. So if you just go over to Main Street and start walking up. Main Street just has everything. It yeah. has a bunch of really good restaurants. But it's funny. I was just, my wife and I were down in uh, Portsmouth for our 21st anniversary. Oh, nice. And everyone we ran into that was like, where are you guys from? You're like, Biddeford. And they were like, oh, wow, that's a really up and coming place. And we're just like, dude, we've lived there since 2003. And it was like, everyone was like, why do you live oh, in Bitterford? Yeah. Yeah. You know? That's but, a good investment because I'm sure it was much cheaper then. Yeah, it, it's really interesting because I intentionally moved here without knowing it. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> it, it like I wanted to be in a place where I had the freedom of a space like this yeah. to to say this is low cost, high creativity, high authenticity, but low, low financial strain. So you had the ability to focus on the creativity that you wanted to do rather than taking all of your assets and giving it to a a town and or, or an environment that can charge it because it's already been made nice by creative people now owned by less creative people that milk it for money. That's yeah. Portland. Yeah. And it's a nice place. And if you can afford to live there, great. And if you can afford to live there as a creative, you must be doing extremely well. But I still just don't like to live in someone else's creation. I 
there, there's something about like Bitterford had potential and I was able to, uh, somewhat contribute to that in what little way I was able to, but also, um, watch it happening and benefit from somewhere that was more in work rather than finished. Yeah. So now Bitterford, the prices are pretty high now, which is odd. So the next place is kind of like probably Sanford. So, yeah. And that's way too far from the ocean. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, there you go. Bitterford's still your only option. Well, I bet Old Orchard will probably be cheaper here soon. Mm -hmm. So, and Old Orchard actually has really good waves for learning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah. a really it's a really gradual beach. So the waves are I like aren't those. Really those are nice. Thumpy. Yeah, yeah, you can walk out quite a bit. I mean, like even today, if you went up uh I might go surfing again later today, but like the north end of Old Orchard is uh is probably gonna be pretty good today. Just probably like waist high and easy. So nice. Hmm. But yeah, the health food store here in town's really good too. I, I, I usually to... go there for the sweet potato chili. So I have to check that out. And those waves. And those waves. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Not on my side. What about you? I would, we could probably go on forever and just forget about stuff. But um, so you're planning on your this next year, you're going to be in Israel for the yeah. whole year working as an EMT potentially? Yeah. So I'm getting my EMT certification in Israel. It's a very rigorous 10 day. Do you have family over I there? I do. Yeah. My okay, mom's cool. side of the family lives there and it's a 10 day course, which sounds like not a lot of time, but it's from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. straight. That's, that's going to be work. a lot. So it's a hundred, it is like 120 hours of just complete course. And then I'm going to be on an ambulance and then for the summer and then for the fall, I'm going to be doing this like gap year program in Israel where it's awesome. You like tr- travel a little bit and you get another history and um, I get my Hebrew a lot better. Um, and then now, do they speak primarily Hebrew in Israel? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, but it's probably like you can pretty easily find people. That That's why I was English. like, I was really impressed because I mean, I speak Hebrew. My family speaks Hebrew like at home as our second language, or honestly, first and first. But you can go to like, honestly, Israel is a beautiful place to visit. The beaches are great and you can speak English and There's everybody will understand. Too. Everybody will understand English. I mean, you just go and you say like, I mean, my family... My like my aunt, her English is almost. I actually think it is better than mine. <laughs> and I'm like, it's very like, I, it's very impressive because like I speak it every day. But um, yeah. So don't be afraid to not go to Israel just because of the language barrier or right. the, the safety and politics. Because the media, it doesn't show what it's really like. It's really a great place to visit. Most any place you'll go yeah. in the world outside of America, probably safer in America. <laughs> I mean, on, sad to say, but yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we actually live with so many sketchy situations, but just because you're familiar with them, they don't feel dangerous. You know, I heard in Norway, Kaitech sociology, people like will just leave your kids on the street and you'll go into a store. Doesn't happen here at all. Like here, you will like take you like strapping your kid to your body. You're like, yeah, I'm protecting you Dude, from all the bad people. I had a friend of mine was in a meeting in Portland gave no he was in a meeting with a client the client gave their kid like 10 bucks and said yeah go get some ice cream or whatever we'll be here come back kid was like 10 or 12 i think and like 15 minutes later the kid comes back with uh some massive federal agent holding the kid what this is this is from a person this portland there yes this is from a person that I've known my whole life who does not exaggerate and is not intimidated. This guy is the most testosterone aggressive person I <laughs> Love know. Love that, yeah. Okay? So he says this guy comes into the room and everyone there immediate was like, this guy's the authority. We're going to listen to that guy. He said the guy was like in the suit of like someone of extreme authority, but it's just a shoot. You could tell the guy was built, not a ounce of fat on (laughs) him, and entered the room with all the authority of any room he could enter in the country. Kind of, it was just this presence of like, what the heck? That ass brings a kid in and is like, do not let your kids go out on the street here. We're conducting an operation that just don't let your kids go out on the street here. (laughs) Oh my God. And left. And, and the guy had a gun and stuff, I guess. And everyone, I guess, you know, was just like, what? 
the hell just is happened. going on? That's like, crazy. and the kid was just kind of like, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> time we to get some ice cream. Yeah, yeah. you know, and yeah, it, there, there's a lot of weird stuff going on these days, but you never know until you, you run into it. You yeah. know, I mean, I've not hitchhiked, but I mean, I've traveled through Central America and it, I mean, you, you're always a target if you look like you're an American when you go out of the country yep. and wealthy, whatever. But at the same time, man, America is a dangerous place too. Mm -hmm. So get out there. Yeah, just get out there. So after that, I'm just going to come back through Europe, see what I hit and come back here and either start college or continue with photography. And I mean, honestly, I'll be continue with photography through college, but now what is it you'd like to, no pun intended, focus on with photography primarily? Um, I mean, I feel like everybody says this, but like National Geographic is like the dream. Yeah. And being able to like, being paid to travel to places all around the world and be like a nomad. Mm -hmm. That's that's the dream, to be yep. like a nomad, not have to have a place I call home, but the world can be my home. I can like go anywhere and feel safe. And honestly, it's not even about feeling safe because I love, I'm kind of a daredevil. I love taking rest and doing fun yeah. things. Um, it's more just seeing what's out there and not seeing it through uh, TV or the news. It's more seeing it with my own eyes, seeing what's really true. Right. And it's experiencing right. new places and cool. cultures. I got a buddy, Joe Carter, who uh, I was on a surf trip in Nicaragua with him he's got a disconnect like he just wanders into anything yeah. anywhere and like i'm too scared to do that on my own and in like social situations mm -hmm. in a in a foreign place like that i really like to have someone who at least knows the language oh, and yeah. you know just at least a sidekick to you know <laughs> but he was like yeah i'm just gonna go and i was like heck yeah let's go <laughs> and the other guys we were there with were just like heck no they stay in the boundaries of the camp where you're surfing mm. you know but he wants to get out like he just wanders in and out of alleys and stuff and will interact that. with like yeah. a nicaraguan family hanging out in their house he's like hey do you mind if i take your print you know and <laughs> wow so yeah. i had i followed him to this it was like a geez what would you call it it was like a a makeshift bullfight oh cool they okay they had built yeah. like a two-story thing that just people you know how like bees will swarm onto things? Mm -hmm, of course. People had swarmed onto this. <laughs> and underneath it was a very shoddily constructed wood structure. And in the middle was just bowls. And wow. the Were dudes- Were they fighting each other? It was kind of like a rodeo. Okay. Where they'd put a guy with like a skateboard helmet on <laughs> that, yeah. that was half drunk on no. the bull and they let it <laughs> loose and the kid and uh, so people funny. would run into the ring and just like ah and then the bull would come at him and they'd run to the fence and dive under the fence. It was insane. That is like, crazy. <laughs> and I I he just like wandered all over that thing. He went on the ground floor. So you're underneath all the people up top, like potentially yeah. throwing up, spitting, and urinating. Oh God. You're on the first floor in here. It was so intense. And like there's always in those things, there'll be kids that are just like, hey, money, money, you know, and I don't know the language well enough. And I'm just like, ah, ah, ah. and he just like threw the whole thing, no problem. Like Love he's that. the strangest guy like that and i just wish like it's so fun to go with him and do stuff like that but just spontaneous just doing the whatever. the photos i got from it are just like so cool there was this girl there and she was just in this shaft of light and she had this hat on and she just looked like right at me knowing i was taking the photo and gave me this look you know and then there's these this one shot of this bull coming right at me. Oh my god! And there's a foot coming into frame with a, just a flip flop on it. You know, he's out there running from a bull in uneven yeah. ground in flip flops. And there's like a beer half flying with beer coming out of it. No over here. way! That is the perfect shot. <laughs> oh, it's insane. And oh, I mean, are you worried about like people like taking your lenses and stuff when you're there? You just you go just... with one camera, one, one camera, lens, one lens, and oh, really? two one hands lens. on it. Wow. And yeah. And I mean, a lot of times I'll just, I love going out with just a little Fuji, um, the little point and shoot guy that looks oh, all retro cool. and stuff. Okay, In that yeah. case, I think I probably had a 2470 and a Canon uh, okay. Mark III, whatever. Um, but the, I I love that kind of stuff. It's it's super fun. Um, 
but I, I just never found how to monetize that as, as well. So I, I, yeah, like portraits and those t styles. Yeah. And I'm not, true. I'm not a, I'm not a social person that can evoke that same feeling out of people. I, I mm -hmm. feel kind of like a robot when I approach people and I'm, I'm kind of off putting, um, where my buddy Joe's this, this really humble, non obtrusive, you know, he's just, he knows how to do it and I can watch him do it. And if I'm on his coattails, I can kind of like, you know? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, he's got a lot of, a lot of talent and the stuff he sees is just so, so cool. Um, but yeah, those situations are just wandering like that. Like I did a project on interviewing homeless people in Portland because I had heard that there was like a homeless mafia that controlled no certain way. points you where you could That's crazy. panhandle. And so I was like, I, I had a week, you know, a week of no work. And so I was like, I'm going to go out there every day and find these homeless camps that happen in between highway turn things and strip malls that are just force that no one cares about and like get footage of these things and find some people to interview and Did see you what's talk going to them on. like you said kind of your, like or like yeah how does that always work when you're in the field kind of take your picture or you just yeah you just i i got um got probably 35 dollar uh dunkin donuts gift cards mm. and so i'd be like hey do you mind if i interview you Wait, around 30... the homelessness situation and i'll give you a five dollar dunkin donuts gift card okay 35 like, yeah. dollar gift cards not 35 dollar right, right. gift. okay right. <laughs> um and and i would just approach people that way i set up a thing over here too where i just had a a, a cooler of like cokes and i had a lighting set up hmm. and i'd be like hey if i'll you know trade you a soda for your portrait and so anyone walking by <laughs> just like awesome. okay so i got like mailmen and an ex stripper and like homeless oh, no people wow. and you know, whoever coming through. And that was really fun and interesting. Um, but the homeless project was really interesting because we actually got to the homeless camps out in the woods and they were actually really organized. They had little really? gardens they were growing. Nice. You could see inside the tents that like they were neatly like, wow. You know? And, and I found there's no, there's no homeless mafia controlling anything. It was just, you found that there was primarily three to four issues around homelessness and it was either mental disorder that's untreated drug addiction or, um, uh, health issues causing late, late age bankruptcy kind of stuff. So you'd have like, you know, a husband and wife in their late sixties that are just homeless because mm. of health issues. No, it's, and it's just, it's just so the sad. saddest thing to see. Um, but unfortunately most of the audio of all, it was pretty bad. I didn't really know what I was doing at the time, but oh, okay. we got, I mean, we interviewed some guy that had died seven times. Are you kidding me? That's they just crazy. Keep stabbing him and bringing him back, you know? And he's like, yeah, I'll probably die. And then, you know, you could tell as soon as we were done with the interview, he was off to get a hit, you know? And huh. It's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a really weird situation. And the thing that they pointed out is that everyone in that homeless situation in Portland is in this, this little radius of here's where you can stay for free for the night. Here's where you can get uh, your drug rehab going, but only for a week to get over the dope sickness, but you're still like socially and everything. You're still in that, that system. You're still like, you're still, your friends are still doing drugs and you're yeah. still dependent on these free meals and all these drugs are right here with all your friends. There's no way you're not getting back into it, you know? So you, you've got the the homeless shelter to, where you can stay. You have your free food. And then you have your methadone clinic. And and it's like there you just get caught in that cycle. And they're like, I who designed this? This is not working well for us. And they'll all just tell you that. Yeah. And they're like, you know, thanks. We get to do drugs endlessly here. And most of us are dying. But it's not ending this, you know? And they'll tell you they need a tougher love approach but the people doing it you know they're they're at a loss for like what they can actually do so it, mm -hmm. it's a hard situation really hard it was it was sad to see it was just such hopelessness you know there's not like one solution to it it's like, which is the worst part like obviously it would have already been done yeah and like... i mean in nicaragua I, you'd come across people that there was this guy who I think he was paralyzed from the waist down, but mm -hmm. he had a container full of shoes behind him. 
he'd come every day in his wheelchair, open the thing up. People would drop off shoes and he just sat there all day fixing shoes. Wow. And at the end of the day, he closed his container up and went home. And the guy, I got a portrait of him. I think he was, there was two guys there. I'm not sure if he's the one that was in the wheelchair, but he had like, his coloring was kind of Nicador, went Nicaragua. I forget the what they call themselves. Nicaraguan. Nicaragua. You know Nicaraguan, but he had these ice, like almost white blue eyes. Oh wow! And it was so it was just the most amazing. Like whoa, dude! You know, I was yeah. like, can I get your portrait? And he's like, sure. Is super. <laughs> he's super like, I get nice that guy. a lot. <laughs> he didn't. <Yeah. laughs> he, was, he was down a deep alley yeah. down. Oh wow! But I mean, it was like here's a guy who's faced with extreme hardship in his life but he's making it happen every day you know he's not he's not falling into like seeing himself as a victim and and allowing for like this coddling of him like he like he had self-worth and a purpose every day and he was there doing it and it was yeah. just i don't know if that's the right approach or what we're doing but either way it was it was it was an interesting contrast to see and that's you know in filling out your map of reality it's one of those things, you know, and the more you get to know life outside of the U.S., the more strange and just comical this existence seems hmm. to me. So, wow, it's weird. It's about well, if that's not deep. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what is. <laughs> well, for today, the, well, uh, appreciate you coming down and, and yeah. allowing me to to turn this into a podcast. So thank you for having can me. Can people a lot. find you on Instagram? And yeah. Stuff if so you want, or Kobe Khan, um, Kobe dot Khan, K O B I dot K A H N right. is my uh, Instagram and YouTube, where I will be posting my first YouTube video. Out nice. Right after this, probably. <laughs> cool. Um, well, you can. We can send yeah. you this video to put on there about the uh, if you want to. Oh my so. god, that'd be awesome. So Sweet. this will be the whole like uh, business plan of your life coming up. You'll see, like check in, and, and I'll have that. Years. I'll have that Mr. Beast like title clickbait. <laughs> Press clickbait. this to change your life. <laughs> like on, the, it's always someone with very white teeth and very white uh, sclera. They call it. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you look at any of the thumbnails, they make the the white Dude, of the actually, eyes ultimately white. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Beast throws like that too. That's and, crazy. Uh, if, have you listened to interviews with him? Of course, yeah. Just absolute gaming the system. Like, and good for him. It, it's it's interesting. Like, he's doing what he wants to do, and, and he's doing it. Like, yeah. he's created a business, like, it's just an insane business model out of just YouTube videos. You know, <laughs> if he told you, your mom, you know, now, <laughs> I'm going to do YouTube videos. Like, uh, no, you're not. <laughs> you're going to be hopelessly broke and ridiculous. It's a billion dollars later. You're like, hey, when, when do you got to say no? Wow. Yeah. Anyways, Crazy. check out Kobe Khan at Kobe dot con K A H N. Right Dude's going to Israel for the next year. Yep. So should have some really cool stuff. Oh, to I'm post. definitely gonna take some awesome po uh, pictures and I'll, videos. I will be following along and commenting. Oh, sweet. <laughs> and and I will be jealousizing your um your adventure abroad. I think I'm gonna try to do a day in the life of an EMT. We'll see if they let me take a <laughs> GoPro strap to my chest, but. I wonder like how much you can you can you know translate the experience from Israeli to American yeah you know the the reality I'll do my best to find like the actual on the street what it's like yeah so yeah yeah it should be it's great. such a beautiful place mm -hmm. I need to go sometime so oh, definitely cool well thanks for coming down yeah thank you <laughs> <laughs>